we'll see how it works. But at this point, I'm gonna introduce Jason Baker of the National Marine Fishery Service to run this session on stock assessment. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for showing up after lunch. And I wanna start by uh, acknowledging all the staff and CSA members that helped to work on this session. There were a lot of them, so I, I wrote them down so I wouldn't forget it. It was Aaron and Brady, and Vicki and Lori and Jackie from the staff, and then Karen and, and Robert also. So thanks for putting together what I think is gonna be a really great session on climate change and stock assessment. And just to be uh, entirely clear, by stock assessment in this context, we're specifically talking about marine mammal stock assessments as prescribed and described in the Marine Mammal Protection Act. And fundamentally, the stock assessment system and the process is a powerful tool for ascertaining the status of populations and then gauging whether human activities that directly kill or injure animals are at a sustainable level. But as we have heard uh, the last day and a half, climate change impacts on marine mammals are rarely, if ever, direct. Uh, and the pathways are very convoluted as demonstrated by the, the graph in our paper that Francis and, and Peter showed and which Francis pointed out that I misspelled atmosphere in. Yeah, well, we never read the paper after we submitted it. But so these are convoluted pathways and the, act, the, uh, the effects are indirect. So it's, it's a fair question whether or not climate change is even relevant to the stock assessment process. And in my opinion, the answer to that is that we, we've heard a lot of examples so far, and we'll hear more in the next session about how uh, stock assess or how climate change can impact every single element that is a part of the stock assessment process. So from stock definition and from range and abundance and trend, and even uh, overlap of marine mammal and marine mammals and, and lethal human activities. So if we don't account or don't understand and don't detect and quantify these uh, climate change impacts, then I think we're gonna start to erode the ability of our stock assessments to actually fulfill the, the goals of the MMPA that they're supposed to do. So next, we are going to hear from five brilliant speakers who are going to be covering topics ranging from the basics of how marine mammal stock assessments are conducted, the challenges of executing this kind of work in the, in the context of climate change, and then also uh, the intersection of stock assessments with broader efforts to conserve and manage marine mammals in a changing climate. And first up is Eric and he is going to talk about the stock assessment process at National Marine Fishery Service. Thanks, Jason. Um, and thanks everyone for in the room and those online and a special thanks to the commission for inviting me to speak today. Um, as Jason said, um, there uh, is a specific section of the MMPA focused on marine mammal stock assessments. I'm going to try to give a brief overview of how NIMS approach is implementing this section. Uh, I emphasize NIMS because NIMS and Fish and Wildlife share jurisdiction on marine mammals. Um, I won't speak specifically to differences between the agencies, but there's um, some fish and wildlife folks in the room that can potentially speak to that if we want to get into that. So I'm going to be focusing on the overview, try to provide a level playing field so that we all know what we're talking about in terms of stock assessments. Um, as Jason noted, uh, stock assessments are really focused on direct human impacts, but I will try to, throughout uh, this presentation, uh, emphasize where there's potential room to look at climate change impacts more indirectly, as well as when they might directly impact some of the metrics like Jason talked about. So um, thank you for bearing with me. I will just quickly acknowledge uh, both Karen Forney and Shannon Bartridge who provided some of the slides that I stole from them, whether or not they know that. Um, I have to support this talk, so thank you guys. 
Okay, so in 1994, as most of us know, um, the Marine Mammal Protection Act was amended uh, with quite a few significant amendments. One of those was introducing this concept of stock assessments or stock assessment reports, and that's in Section 117 of the MMPA. The MMPA is pretty specific uh, in terms of what we are required to do, the agency is required to do, and, and to provide in stock assessment reports. Um, so far, so that it even provides somewhat mathematical equations, which is kind of unique for a statute. So I'll go through some of the aspects that's required in the statute uh, for the agencies to put into stock assessment reports. I listed five here, just building the important aspects um, to kind of call your attention to. Stock assessment reports are considered the best scientific information available. That's important because that's informing our management decisions. Um, the, we have to include a description of the geographic range. Some key metrics like the minimum population estimate, the net productivity rates, uh, and the current population trend, though those are often difficult to get. Uh, as Jason noted, they're really focused on um, direct human caused uh, annual mortality rates, as well as serious injury, which I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, we do need to characterize these by source. Uh, and I've builded this other, uh, this, this what's called another, well, what I'm going to call another factor here. Um, which is for strategic stocks, there's a focus on any other factor that could be impacting or impeding the recovery uh, or causing the stock to be depleted. Um, so there's there to include anything else specifically for a strategic stock. So climate change might fit into there. Um, there is a large focus uh, on interactions with commercial fisheries um, that needs to be included in stock assessment reports. Ultimately, we need to describe the status, which I'll explain what that means of the stock. Um, and a very important metric that most folks here are probably familiar with is uh, the biological removal level. So to get into a few more of these, um, first I want to talk about a little bit about the process, and then I'll go kind of into some definitions. Um, so another important aspect of 117 of the MMPA is the establishment of three regional scientific review groups, or what we often refer to as the SRG. These are independent bodies established by the secretaries uh, to advise the agencies on marine mammal science in general, basically. Uh, but the statute does list out very specific things that they are uh, to advise the sec secretaries on, including population estimates, um, uncertainties and research that are needed for the population for the stocks. Um, of course, human caused mortality and serious injury and ways to reduce those. Um, I have, again, called out habitat destruction, natural environmental change as potentially places where climate change might come into effect, um, as well as appropriate conservation measures. But then, of course, there's this catch all of any other issue which they or the secretary deems appropriate. So really, it's wide open in terms of what the SRGs uh, can advise us on. And uh, most of the time, they take advantage of that, which is helpful, uh, but also hard in some ways. So how does this process work? Uh, I'm going to emphasize the difference between our review and our revised process. So the statute requires us to review stock assessment reports. Uh, that is after the first ones were developed, 95 after the 94 amendments. Every year annually, that's the review for strategic stocks, which I know you don't want necessarily know what that means yet, but I'll get to it in a minute. For non-strategic stocks, it's every three years. Um, I will add for the strategic stocks, we also should be reviewing st uh, stock assessment reports for stocks for which there's significant new information, although that's not well defined in the statute. So once we go through the review process, if we determine that there's substantive new information, ultimately this comes down to, could we better define the status of the stock or could it change? Um, we would go ahead and revise that. Um, and so you can see the process that we take right here um, in terms of reviewing and revising. We then develop drafts, we call these preliminary drafts, that um, are presented to the scientific review groups for a review. Uh, we go through a, a peer review process where they provide feedback. We then put those out for a 90 day public comment period um, and finalizing after public comment is taken into account. So that's our general um, SAR cycle. Um, overall for NIMS, this is an annual process that we execute. Um, of course, not every stock will get a revised stock assessment report on an annual basis, um, but for the most part, we review our suite of stocks um, following what's in the statute and then revise accordingly. Okay, so early on, uh, right after, in fact, during the development of the 94 uh, amendments, um, there was a lot of work uh, underway to try to figure out how are we going to do this in a consistent approach um, and have 
excuse me, um, have has some guidelines uh, to help guide stock assessment scientists so that these things would be comparable across the nation um, and would be useful and for management. So there were a few workshops, which I'm highlighting some here. Um, there's the original, what was called the PBR workshop uh, in 94. Um, that resulted in uh, some tech memos, as well as some work by Paul Wade and Barb Taylor and others. Um, that really informed how we conduct marine mammal stock assessments uh, starting at that point. In 1996, there was the first GAMS, we call them GAMS workshop or guidelines for assessing marine mammal stocks um, that Paul Wade and Robin Inglis led the development of a tech memo following that. That's where we really started having some guidance for stock assessment scientists. And here's how to go about looking at these parameters, calculating these parameters, putting them into the stock assessment reports and what the stock assessment reports should entail. Um, in 2003, we had a workshop, uh, the GAMS 2 workshop. Uh, at that time, the guidelines were put out for public comment, and we've been doing that ever since within NIMS. Um, we've had a few more workshops, uh, GAMS 3 workshop in 2011. That took a while to result in some provisions that were finalized in 2016. And just actually earlier this year in February, we finalized another revision. Um, most of this was done sort of um, virtually, you can imagine, during given the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and the, at this point, our dams were pretty well established. And in fact, in 2016, they were established within NIMS as an official policy in our policy directive system. So this is kind of our, our guidebook, our Bible as to how to go about uh, developing stock assessment reports. Okay, stay, taking a step back and going to some of those pieces I described early on that need to be required in the SAR and what do they mean? I uh, just thought it'd be useful to provide some key definitions. Um, so first, what's a stock? It's a group of marine mammals uh, in the same species or smaller taxa in a common spatial arrangement that interbreed would mature. This might seem pretty straightforward, uh, but there's lots of discussion and interpretation about what this means and actually defining stocks is quite a difficult task. Um, so uh, we can get into that more later, perhaps during this panel discussion and how that might look in the future with climate things and things changing. Uh, potential biological removal or PBR is the maximum number of animals, not including natural mortality that may be removed from a marine mammal stock while allowing for the stock to re reach its uh, optimum sustainable population, or we often refer to as OSP. I mentioned the word strategic a few times, so that is one uh, facet of uh, what the status of the stock is. There's sort of three basic reasons that a stock would be classified as strategic. Um, probably the most relevant one, one that folks are most familiar with, um, is whether or not the direct level of human cause mortality exceeds its PBR level. Um, that's what makes a lot of stocks uh, strategic, and that's often what might trigger management actions depending on the situation. Um, however, a stock can be strategic if it's declining and likely to be listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act within the foreseeable future. So there's a direct tie to the ESA. Um, in B, as well as in C, a stock that is actually already listed as threatened or endangered under the Endangered Species Act. So those species would automatically be classified regardless of their uh, level of direct human cause to mortality. Uh, so given the emphasis on PBR there, I wanted to just go a little bit more into what the statute actually says about PBR. Uh, as I alluded to, there's actually, it describes a specific formula we need to use, and that is uh, the product of the minimum population estimate times one half the maximum theoretical or estimated net productivity rate at a small population size. And I'll just emphasize, because sometimes there's confusion on this one, this is not the actual net, net product, net, uh, excuse me, net productivity rate at any given time, but the theoretical one or at a small population. So what would its maximum be? Um, and then a recovery factor somewhere between uh, 0.1 and 1. So the equation looks something like this. Um, and this is a really key metric that we use in the stock assessment reports for marine mammals. A few other definitions, and then I'll get into how do we actually use them. Um, so OSP, uh, with respect to any stock, is the number of animals which will result in the maximum productivity of the population or the species. Importantly, this is keeping in mind the carrying capacity and the health of the ecosystem. So that's where climate change might start coming into fact and changing the carrying capacity uh, or the health of the ecosystem. Uh, a stock, uh, is that determined to be below OSP? Uh, this is a formal designation, and uh, as simple as it sounds, is is, is not so simple. Um, 
and I mentioned a serious injury a few times. There is not a statutory definition of serious injury, but NIMS has a regulatory definition uh, as well as some policies. And in general, you can think of a serious injury as any injury that's more likely to lead to death than not. So let's say greater than 50% chance is likely to lead to death. So it's a serious injury and we're worried about it causing the animal to die. Okay, so with that behind us, um, I'm borrowing a, a concept um, from probably several other people, but uh, I'll credit Jason Foreman, who at least has stuck it in my head, which is one of our attorneys, and that the stock assessment reports are really the base of our MMPA pyramid. So they provide all the information that feed into the determination of the status, the threats, what are the management units we're considering, and then all the way up into informing what are the actual management actions we might take. So they're really the basis of pretty much everything we do under the MMPA and form all the actions that we can take. So I'll give some examples of those. <clears throat> we use the stock assessment reports when we're evaluating scientific research permits. So a lot of the research that's been done here, uh, I mean, presented here and, and all the research in the US that's done on marine mammals requires uh, MMPA permits and the using the stock assessment reports is how we evaluate whether or not to actually give those permits. Um, they're used to evaluate incidental harassment authorizations or what folks might refer to as IHAs uh, or incidental take regulations to allow the lawful take of marine mammals. Um, and help us make our determinations such as negligible impact determinations, small numbers, uh, and other aspects of those analyses. Specific to commercial fisheries, um, they're key in informing whether or not we have take reduction plans and convene take reduction teams and what the goals of the take reduction teams or take reduction plans are. Um, PEM is the main index we focus on there. Um, they have us in determining what we call the list of fisheries. This is the MMPA list of fisheries, which categorizes fisheries based on their interactions with marine mammals. And we use the stock assessment reports to categorize that. And I'll show you a, a figure in a second that sort of explains how this all fits together. A little lesser known, they also are used uh, to inform our 101A5B authorizations. It's just for take of ESA listed marine mammals and commercial fisheries. Um, and in general, we consider them the best available science. It's a compilation of the best available science on the stocks that we use to support our management. So they're really important documents. Just to give you an example of kind of how this all fits together uh, with marine mammals and stock, uh, sorry, with uh, marine mammal and commercial fisheries interactions, we have the stock assessment reports, as I mentioned, sort of at the bottom, the base of our pyramid here, I have it depicted at the top. We use that to inform classifications of fisheries. So how are these fisheries, depending on the data that's in the stock assessment report, categorized with respect to their uh, interaction to marine mammals? Are they rarely interacting, occasionally, or frequently? And then we give those a category. Based on that, that can result in uh, subsequent management action in terms of potentially developing take reduction teams and take reduction plans. And you can see a list of active ones that we have there. Um, those actions then lead to other actions such as monitoring or regulations or changes in fishery practices that then feed information back into the stock assessment reports and we reassess and see how we're doing. Um, I'll iterate, uh, reiterate here that the stock assessment report for us is a fairly annual process. So in the grand scheme of climate change, we're reevaluating to the extent we have support, uh, financial support resources and the availability uh, of new data, we're reassessing the stocks on a fairly frequent basis. Um, so hopefully that helps somewhat help us uh, keep track of changes that are would be going on with climate change. But the stock assessment reports are uh, retrospective. They're looking back at what happened in the population and describing that they're not necessarily forward-looking documents. Okay, so to kind of uh, just summarize, I've hinted at a few places that climate change could be addressed or brought up in the SARS. Um, I will note that at the time of the MMPA, climate change was not something that was being considered, uh, at least not in the MMPA development. Um, it was not; it's not explicitly required for us to address stock assess for us to address climate change in the stock assessment reports, in the Act itself or in any regulations. Um, but of course, we've seen today uh, many talks and even yesterday about how climate change could impact various aspects of what you might consider to be. Uh, features of a stock assessment report. So changes in distribution to the extent climate change is impacting net productivity um, or population trends, it would obviously show up there, though that's sort of an indirect way that it would show up um, and be included in stock assessment reports. Um, there has been some direct discussion of climate change in the stock assessment reports qualitatively, generally speaking, um, in the status of the stock sections and or in a section we used to have called habitat issues section. 
I'll note that with our most recent GAMS update, we did try to address this a little bit more head on. Um, and we created or proposed the creation uh, of this new section in the SARS directly tied to section 117 of the MMPA called other factors. I'm gonna leave it at dot, dot, dot um, to not read you the whole name where for strategic stocks, there can be a, a focus on some of these other factors that may be impeding the stock's recovery, including climate change. So there's um, there's that new section, which is hopefully starting to be uh, utilized in the upcoming stock assessment reports as we implement the new GAMS. And I'll just end with, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. So I'm really uh, interested in the discussion today and glad to be here um, to hear what folks think um, and to hear questions and suggestions from you all. So with that, I will leave the rest of my time, I think ended Good 12 seconds early. All right. Thank you, Eric. That was a really great foundation for the rest of the talks. Okay. Next up, we have uh, Dave Gustine from the Fish and Wildlife Service. He's going to tell us about polar bears. And there you go. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, it's good to be here. I, I'm new to the service. I've worked for the Fish and Wildlife Service for three years and new to marine mammals also only three years. So it seems like I learned something new in this job all the time. Today is no exception. So apologies, I missed the day yesterday. So I hope some of the material that I'm presenting here is complimentary and not repetitive. So, so if you're looking for the person to give you the agency perspective on how we incorporate climate into SARS, I am not that person. So it's about establishing expectations. I'm not going to give that to you here today. What, what um, the agency doesn't have a structured approach to how to integrate climate into SARS. So that's kind of the punchline. So it's species specific. So I can't talk about polar bears though. Um, and I struggled with what to present to you here today. The, the, I think the, the low hanging fruit would be what I termed explicit. That is looking at abundance of demographics as it relates to sea ice dynamics availability, fasting duration. We just spent a lot of time on that in a species status assessment, and it's over 100 pages. It's online. If you're interested in that, I direct you to, to that document. And, and then I also realized when I thought about the subject for today, we don't, our work doesn't really lie in that arena. It's important. We do it. But most of our time, effort, and money is on these other things down here, changes in distribution, human bear interactions and removals. Uh, we're looking primarily there at harvest and conflict. And then what's really the emphasis of our work, and that's co-management and monitoring and mitigation of these things. And so that's going to be what I'm going to talk about today. I will give you, I expect you to know all about the stocks of polar bears. That's obviously not the case. So I'll give you a, a brief uh, kind of status check on where we are. Um, so here we are, Chuck Chi and Southern Beaufort. Sorry for the polar perspective for those that aren't used to that. Um, both of stocks uh, are harvested uh, by Alaska natives, and they're both part of the divergent ice ecoregion. So uh, bears are busted up into areas depend, uh, based on how sea ice behaves. So for us, um, it's ice peels away from the shore when it retreats. So here we are in the Chukchi uh, bearing uh, sea stock or the Chukchi sea subpopulation. They're one and the same. Last estimate was about 3,000 bears and uh, looks to be fairly stable despite the, the pretty significant changes in sea ice available in that region. Uh, during the open water period, which is typically July to October, more like July, November, it feels like nowadays, this year being an example of that as well, these bears are peeling over, chasing the ice back to Wrangell Island and the Chicokan coast, which is where most of them are gonna be during the open water season. Denning similarly occurs almost entirely on Wrangell Island with some uh, females also denning on the Chicokan coast as well. Obviously 
Maybe not, obviously. They have their own statute in the MMPA, Title V, which is the domestic implementing structure for the U.S.-Russia uh, polar bear bilateral treaty. I'll mention that a little bit later when I talk about command. Here. Southern Beaufort Sea, uh, last estimated at, at 900 bears. Uh, recent work by our excellent USGS colleagues demonstrate that at least the Alaskan portion has been recently stable. Um, during the open water and denning period, it's a little different. We've got uh, an increasing number of bears spending time on shore, uh, most notably um, in the regions of Prudhoe Bay, NPRA, and the Arctic Refuge 1002 during the open water season. Denning, now we've got most of the bears a majority of the bears are denning on land as well currently, and that is a shift. So a, a brief reminder on these climate effects to sea ice. So uh, our colleagues the, at the USGS, Dave Douglas and Todd Atwood, produced this excellent summary comparing the last two iterations of projection models, CMIT 5 and 6, for those familiar with this terminology. And... Here we are looking at the proportion of the ecoregion that's ice covered for the divergent ecoregion. And I'm not gonna dive into it here. You got March up top, September down below, and I've marked mid-century for you there with the blue bar. And a important note, if you don't know it already, is regardless of what happens today, we are locked in to impacts to sea ice at least till mid-century regarding emissions. So that's something we're, we're, we're committed to do. That's no change there. That's not going to change for us. We're going to see a, a gradual decline in sea ice coverage in both March and September through 2050. After that, it all depends on if we get our stuff together, so to speak. So the mission scenario really, really tells us how things are going to be, how good they're going to be, or how bad they're going to be. Currently, um, we are in the unabated emissions trajectory, right? So we kind of, we look at the red line for what some people term the worst case scenario, which means for bears, continued significant reductions in their primary habitat in the wintertime and probably an ice-free Arctic uh, during the open water season. Some work from Karen Road uh, tells us how this is gonna impact potentially polar bear distribution. So there's a lot going on here. I'm not gonna go into it, but just notice that we got both stocks here, one on the left, one on the right. And then the top two figures are percent of bears on shore. The bottom are days on shore. And what we, you've got in the black dots and the black lines are observed. And then we've got our projections, right? Past 2040 um, with our emission scenarios. And I've marked mid-century there in both figures um, in the blue line again, just to give you for a reference of where mid-century is. And so I'm not gonna tell you how much is gonna increase, what the change is gonna be. The, the, what's all that matters to us and the people that live with these, these bears is that the bears, a large proportion of these stocks are gonna be on shore. And we've seen that and we're gonna continue to see that. And they're gonna be on shore for longer, possibly a lot longer by the end of the century. So, people and bears are gonna be closer together longer. How is this structured our priorities? Obviously resources are not limited. We can't do everything. And so recently we had a five-year review and we, we stated clearly what our management priorities were. Some people asked me if it was a difficult process and it really wasn't. For us, it's about people and our Alaska Native partners. And so the top two things there collaboratively managing subsistence harvest and human bear conflicts rise above everything else all the time. And that's exactly where all our resources are going as well and where they're gonna go in the foreseeable future. So regarding co-management, what this looks like, our partners, um, the Alaska and Anuk Co-Management Council and the Fish and Wildlife Service have been working closely since 2018, really intensely the last three years and developing what that co-management re relationship looks like, right? It's all about creating pathways for trust, establishing param parameters in the relationship. And we are, um, with the focus really is on sustainable subsistence management and how we can monitor subsistence use. That's 
that's the the, the key to co-management. That's pretty much what this whole framework looks like. A lot of partners, ANCC, who I just mentioned, North Slope Borough, of course, the affected communities or tribes, and hunters as well. It's about formalizing what co-management looks like. It's establishing the parameters of the relationship, if you have to think about it that way. And how it looks on the ground is it's going to be a tribally administered harvest monitoring and management program, which will include enforcement in some cases. Of course, a key element of this is we've got to be really good at monitoring stocks or subpopulations too. So that information, the best available science can feed into the co-management framework that depends on it. So what does harvest monitoring and management look like? Harvest monitoring, it's going to be just a little twist on our current program of the marking, tag, tagging, and reporting program where we have taggers and communities. In this case, you're going to have tribal community-based monitors that interact with hunters to collect the information that's required by statute in the, in the MTRP, as well as additional information regarding hunters' experiences, what they encountered, their knowledge sets, possibly collect samples, these kinds of things. This would be for both stocks. We're really, really confident this is going to increase all elements of reporting, timeliness, accuracy, and completion of reports. So we're excited about this. This is a good thing. And it's going to be, I think, more importantly, it's going to be a basis for the harvest management plan that we have hoped to have in place for the Chuck Chi um, once this all gets formalized. Harvest management would be in the Chuck Chi uh, C subpopulation. Of course, that's covered under the MMPA Title V, which um, we're having challenges implementing, obviously, with the Russians not being engaged, or us not being engaged with the Russians. But this is an, a, a really uh, important lever for co-management. It gives both Alaskan and Russian natives equal say in management of the resource, and it's through the, through the U.S.-Russia Polar Bear Commission. And it's driven on consensus. So, so one nay can, can change the direction of things. We can't implement it that way. Right now, we're moving forward with the commission's last intent, and that's kind of how we're proceeding and hoping for better days regarding Russian engagement. We do have a sustainable harvest level in place uh, on the U.S. side at 42 and a half bears, which are we are moving forward with and our co-management partners and implementing that. Southern Beaufort Sea is a little different. Uh, harvest is, is, I don't want to say governed, but there's an agreement with the Alaskan and Canadian native communities about what the voluntary quota is, and that's in place. We're uh, hopeful for a next abundance estimate in 2025, and then shortly thereafter with a harvest risk assessment. But, but critical to all this, and maybe it's stating the obvious, is we have to have robust abundance estimates at regular intervals that incorporate indigenous knowledge. And we've got to have local and regional buy-in or this, is, this whole system falls apart. Okay, so our conflict program, um, two-pronged really, all about uh, making sure people are safe and we, we reduce the number of bears that are killed associated with conflict. This is a not overstatement. The Polar Bear Patrol Program is something that's been in place since 2010. It's about one of the most impactful things we do. And members of communities on the North Slope are work for the North Slope Borough to actively manage bears in those communities. Uh, and we're looking at expanding in the Chukchi Bering region. There, you may not know there was a tragedy in Wales last year where a mother and infant son were killed by a polar bear. It shook the whole region and the community. So we're working with them to make sure they have what they need regarding human bear conflicts. Our industry setting, uh, pretty standard bear management stuff, right? It's both proactive and reactive framework. Bears, a lot of bears run through the, the oil field. Uh, a lot of sightings with almost all of those occurring in the open water season, July through November. Standard stuff, attractive management, non-lethal deterrence programs. We have regulations in place and we work with our industry partners to make sure we're monitoring interactions and we do the best we can to make sure we mitigate, of course, any lethal lethal removals and any other sorts of take as best we can. It works really, really well. We've in instituted a capture tag and release program. Uh, we also have a den emergency response program. And then we last year, we, we responded to an orphan cub in the oil field as well. 
So take home messages, more bears will be on shore for longer and in closer proximity to people for longer periods in both stocks. Like bear management anywhere, anywhere, this is gonna mean bears and people are gonna have more interactions. There's definitely gonna be more human sa uh, safety concerns and the stock assessment report link, there's most likely gonna be more human cause removals. We don't, that's not reflected in our current trend uh, regarding the data we have, but we're planning for it. Harvest and conflict for those that are familiar with um, how this works are intertwined in both stocks, right? And we have no contemporary information from Chicoka, and we don't expect any information to come in any anytime soon regarding what's going on over on the Russian coast in the Chukchi stock. The good news is formalizing and implementing co-management will improve harvest monitoring in both stocks and implement ha active harvest monitoring and uh, management, excuse me, in the Chukchi. And more good news, co-management will improve estimates of human cause removals and contributing factors to those removals and help achieve uh, one of the Fish and Wildlife Service's primary conservation goals as outlined in our polar bear conservation management plan. We need abundance estimates and these abundance estimates have to incorporate indigenous knowledge that will and we make sure people are involved in this process from the beginning. Um, this is absolutely required for effective co-management and will inform our sustainable harvest level estimates, which do account for climate induced changes in K or carrying capacity. And this is gonna be something that we all probably say, uh, maybe stating the obvious, but durable funding sources are needed for co-management, conflict management and subpopulation monitoring, for instance, if we do, we're really close to implementing co-management and formalizing it, we have no money in place to implement the co-management plan. So that's a huge limitation for us. And lastly, I'm over time, but any questions on the Polar Bear Program that don't pertain to our subject of the session or anything, feel free to email me. I'm happy to chat on anything at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. That was uh, super informative. You have a really tough job, and um, I'm impressed that you had so many positive, good news points in your final bullet or your final slide there. Okay. Uh, next up is Matt Lettrich with the NIMS Office of Science and Technology, and he is going to tell us about marine mammal climate vulnerability assessments. There you go. All right, thanks for having me here today. Um, hi everyone, my name is Matt Lettrick. I'm a contractor with No Fisheries Office of Science and Technology. As Jason said, I'll be talking about the marine mammal climate vulnerability assessments that No Fisheries has been uh, developing and implementing over the past few years. Understanding how protected species and specifically in the case of my work, marine mammals and sea turtles, how those populations uh, may respond to changing climate conditions, it's important for developing and implementing conservation actions. Uh, one approach to understanding those responses is with something called climate vulnerability assessment. Uh, this provides a metric of how susceptible a population is to harm from climate change. Uh, many of those populations are data limited and CVAs, climate vulnerability assessments, that's the, the acronym you'll be hearing uh, throughout this presentation, um, CVAs provide an approach for populations that span the spectrum from data rich to data limited. Vulnerability is effectively a combination of two components. One is how much of a change in conditions a population is expected to experience, that's exposure, and the other is how well that population can tolerate or adapt to that change in condition, um, and that's our combination of sensitivity and adaptive capacity. We use what is known as a trait-based approach, where we look at the life history characteristics of the population to gauge how sensitive and how adaptive they are. Uh, we measure the exposure based on modeled uh, changes in the environmental conditions within their geographic region. Uh, broadly speaking, to assess the population, we look across its prey, its habitat, its reproduction 
um, both parameters and behavior across its spatial extent, across um, population uh, parameters, and non-climate threats. So you can see the, the list of the specific attributes we used for marine mammals up here. Um, within each of these attributes, we have four well-defined criteria for what it means to be low vulnerability or low sensitivity, moderate sensitivity, high sensitivity, and very high sensitivity. To assess exposure to climate change, we look at how much of the population's spatial distribution overlaps with uh, magnitude of change. So we're looking at these different care, uh, climate factors, and we're looking at the change in the mean conditions and the change in the variability of the conditions at mid-century. And all of that is relative to the most recent past century. For marine mammals, we've conducted two climate vulnerability assessments, one on the East Coast, Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean, and we've done another on the West Coast, Pacific Islands and Alaska. Um, it's also important to note, NOAA Fisheries has also conducted climate vulnerability assessments for fish, for habitat, for fishing communities and for sea turtles. And you can kind of see the regions that uh, overlap there. Now to actually conduct the scoring for these assessments, um, we gather a group of experts and these experts score individually at first, then we bring them together to discuss their scores. And then following that discussion, experts are able to change their scores based on any new information that they've been presented. Um, this kind of a process is called a Delphi approach and it's a tool that's been used for expert elicitation for anything from business planning to grant funding. So it's, it's pretty widely used. Um, Using the expert's final set of scores, we calculate an exposure score, a sensitivity score, and then ultimately a, a vulnerability score for each of the populations. Um, the math behind that is uh, generalized here on this slide. So we take all of the scores from all of our experts, from all of our stocks, put it all together into one set. And then for each attribute, we can uh, calculate a weighted mean for that attribute. We take that weighted attribute mean and process it through a logic model to get the individual component scores for each stock. And then uh, again, those component scores, that's sensitivity and uh, exposure. And then we process those component scores through a vulnerability matrix, and that gives us our vulnerability score. Um, this vulnerability matrix is a, a typical visualization that you'll see for a lot of climate vulnerability assessments. Um, Basically what we have here is we have sensitivity on one axis, we have exposure on the other axis, and based on where the population score for each of those, uh, that's the cell that they'll fall into, and that's the, the color-coded cell in the middle, which um, uh, gives us the vulnerability. Um, so something that's low sensitivity, low exposure, that's gonna be low vulnerability. If it's very high exposure, very high sensitivity, that'll be very high vulnerability. And this matrix is really useful for teasing out all of the situations in between. Um, now, as I mentioned, we've done two vulnerability assessments for the East Coast, Gulf of Mexico, and Caribbean. Our results published in PLUS One uh, in September. Um, for the West Coast, Pacific Islands, and Alaska, we're still working on that one. We have all of our scores. Um, we're just working through the, the draft, and I expect to have a, a draft back to the co-authors later this month, and we hope to be submitting sometime shortly thereafter. Um, when we put all of these scores onto this matrix, and again, the, the numbers that you're seeing within that matrix, that's the number of populations that score out at that combination of sensitivity and exposure. Um, and then within the color code, that's the number of populations that fall within that vulnerability score. Uh, so one of the, the things that you'll notice is that most of these populations end up on the right sides of the matrix. So what this means is that a lot of these populations are expected to experience multiple climate factors that are, are highly exposed. So these are, are populations that are expected to see significant changes in the climate conditions um, in the, the next uh, 20 to 30 years. Another thing you'll notice is that we do have a number of populations that show up in the top right. So in the, the very high and high vulnerability categories. And for these populations, it's really important to drill down into what are the drivers of their sensitivity and their vulnerability, because that's where we start to see the differences between the populations. So for each of the, the populations that we score, um, each assessment unit, and that could be species, that could be stock, that could be DPS, um, that could be a group of, of stocks. So we have a, a number of different uh, units that we, we conducted the assessment at. Um, each one of those has a, 
a visualization similar to this. And the goal for this is for a reader to be able to pick it up and quickly scan across and see what are the primary factors that are affecting the vulnerability of a population. So this one is showing for North Atlantic right whale, um, just the sensitivity attributes. Looking across this, we can see that prey and diet specificity, habitat specificity, site fidelity, species abundance trend, cumulative stressors, these are the ones that are mostly red in our visualization. And so those are the factors that are really driving the sensitivity of this population and therefore also driving the vulnerability of it. We also have this uh, visualization for the exposure factors, but it just, it'd be really difficult to read up on the slide here. So I focused in on, on just this one. Um, as we were developing these climate vulnerability assessments, we really had two audiences in mind for the results. So one being managers, the other being uh, researchers. And one of the ways that the, the CVAs can overlap with management is through the climate ready conservation and management framework. Um, so the, the CVAs really identify which species are most vulnerable to climate change and what is it that's driving that vulnerability. And that sets them up as a great way to identify candidate populations, candidate stocks, candidate species, for exercises like scenario planning. And then once we move into scenario planning, this information serves as an input uh, to those kinds of exercises as well. Um, coming out from those kinds of exercises, we have uh, potential climate-informed management actions and also uh, actions that can ideally uh, reduce the vulnerability of these populations. Um, Management options, they can be viewed through spatial and temporal scales. Uh, one of the next questions that we need to answer is how do climate vulnerability assessments overlay onto these different management frameworks? Um, answering that question, that can really help the researchers identify different contexts in which they can be asking their question and posing their research questions, um, specifically thinking about modeling exercises. Uh, the climate vulnerability assessments can be used as input to prioritizing which stocks, which populations, which species really need or, or really could benefit from that um, more advanced modeling. Um, the CVAs are also really good at identifying the data gaps and the information needs. So um, part of the CVAs is gathering all of the background information about each of those individual attributes that I showed earlier. And we can quickly look across our species narratives and see where we have um, some clear data gaps. Um, and working to uh, fill those data gaps that can help us uh, better understand what the climate impacts might look like. And today we're talking specifically about stock assessment reports, and we're thinking about how the climate vulnerability assessments can layer onto the SARS. Um, so at the base level, we can take the results from the climate vulnerability assessments, so that vulnerability score, and we can uh, pull that into the stock assessment report. Um, to go a step further, we can be looking at those individual drivers of vulnerability. So within sensitivity, within exposure, what is it that's really driving the vulnerability of that stock? And that's something that could also be informing the stock assessment reports. Um, a conversation that it's, it's really in its infancy right now and we're starting to explore is what might vulnerability mean for PBR? And again, this, this conversation has a, a long way to go, but it's something that we're starting to think about. Um, and finally, I want to reiterate that NOAA Fisheries has conducted these vulnerability assessments, again, for fish stocks and for habitat. And that information for those fish stocks and that habitat could be valuable information to include as context for prey and, and habitat needs for the, the stocks, particularly strategic stocks. Um, one thing I, I do want to mention before I close here is that these Climate vulnerability assessments have, have been a huge collaborative effort. We've had over 100 folks involved from the development to the testing to the implementation. A number of those folks are here in the room now. I know a, no, a number of others are online and none of this work could have happened without all of, all of their help. And uh, this spans folks from NOAA Fisheries, other parts of NOAA, other federal agencies, states, tribal, uh, tribal groups, um, academia, NGOs. So we've had a, a huge involvement of, of folks um, throughout this process. Um, and now one thing I, I do want to leave you with is 
where do you see this information fitting into stock assessment reports? So you all are the ones that that interact with stock assessment reports, both from the the perspective of generating the information that goes into them. Um, some of you are involved in drafting them. Some of you are, are using the information produced um, and presented in the stock assessment report. So where do you see this information fitting in? And also, where do you see the results from these vulnerability assessments interacting with your work, both on the, the work that you're doing on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis? I, I really want to hear where you see this information um, fitting in. So uh, we can close out there and just thank you for your time today. Thanks, Matt. It's very gracious of you to acknowledge all of the hundreds of people. I want to flip that around and say that I was fortunate enough to be involved from the beginning uh, as Matt endeavored to to uh, start and get this thing going. And it's been uh, only because of him that these hundreds of people have been herded together and forced to complete their assessments, read the instructions, and he really keeps us on task. It's uh, it's it's amazing what you've been able to accomplish. Okay, next up is my colleague Aaron Olison from the Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center. Thanks, Jason, and and thanks uh, to the commission for inviting me here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, how climate impacts have shown up in a couple of our SARS, but. I'm actually going to spend most of the time talking about how or can or must um, we adapt our climate, um, adapt our assessment science, that is the surveys that we conduct um, in order to better capture climate impacts. And, and I want to say I am just one of among dozens of assessment scientists in National Marine Fisheries Service. I did poll them for their input for this presentation, and most of them just said, wow, that's hard. Good luck. Um, so thank you for your input. And um, now you're all going to get my version of this. <laughs> so um, first, why does it matter? Um, why might climate matter in the context of stock assessments? And, and one that um, is important that I've thought about a lot, and I think I have some automatic timing going on here, is that climate influences can lead us to get the assessment wrong. And, and by that, I mean that range and distribution shifts could end up masquerading as increases or decreases in population size particularly when we're assessing abundance over a fixed area and, and a particularly popular fixed area for us is an EEZ. Um, and when you have a transboundary stock that may be moving in and out of that EEZ, you could end up um, getting the assessment quite wrong. Um, we also have seen many examples of climate and ecosystem change exacerbating or greatly exceeding other human caused impacts. And, and those are important to, to acknowledge within the SAR context because um, it's really designed under the assumption that human caused impacts are, are the most significant removals. Um, and we've seen some examples from Karen Forney of habitat compression, um, increasing humpback whale entanglements in crab pots. Um, and there's also a recent example of prey limitation in gray whales leading to large scale die offs, which um, then far exceed the typical human caused mortality. So most of the representation of climate in um, the current stock assessment reports shows up in the um, habitat issues section, which has since been renamed, but not widely adopted quite yet. Um, it shows up in reference to climate or environmental change um, and primarily um, for migratory large whales, ice associated cetaceans and several stocks of pinnipeds. Uh, marine heat waves are implicated within the SAR context um, for changes in abundance and production rates for stellar sea lions and humpback whales. Um, and a forthcoming Eastern gray whale SAR will be looking to incorporate um, an integrated population model that links climate associated changes to changes in population abundance and vital rates, including estimating annual carrying annually varying carrying capacity. And that's something that I, I'm just going to table and say I think is going to be an interesting point of discussion in terms of how we think about um, how climate might be influencing the underlying metrics that go into our PBR assessments. Uh, most of these populations have population-specific monitoring programs um, that have persisted for many decades. And that's, that's not really true for most of our species. And that's where I'm going to spend most of my time sort of considering how we might need to move forward in this area. So 
Um, we are responsible overall for providing assessments for hundreds of marine mammal populations um, with different life histories, ecologies, and large variability in the amount and quality of the data available. Um, and we can look to the climate vulnerability assessments to help us prioritize which of those we might want to focus our assessment dollars and efforts. However, I, I think that we, we don't want to focus there alone and that we need to acknowledge that there are many stocks that are data poor for which we just don't understand the climate linkages um, and that we need to really be expanding our assessment toolbox. So the questions that are going to guide the rest of my time here. How can we adjust our assessment surveys to increase the likelihood of detecting range shifts? How can we adjust our assessment analyses to detect and, sorry about that, incorporate climate impacts? And how can we apply new technologies and tools to better measure ecosystem relationships and tech, detect distribution changes? And here I'm going to own my own bias um, in that I run a cetacean program that deals largely with transboundary stocks of pelagic delphinids. Um, and we run multi-species surveys, um, and I'm really coming at it from that context. Um, and also, uh, I am trained as a, a bioacoustician, and you might hear a lot of references to passive acoustics today. So, um, and also, I'm just going to put on the table and not really address further this question about are there alternative assessment metrics that we should be exploring that might make it easier to detect climate influences or really other any other adverse impact. And by this, I mean things like um, using trends or occupancy models rather than as alternative ways of examining NMIN or things like that. So how do we adjust our assessment surveys? And I think this really has to be grounded in our fiscal reality. Um, adding ship days or conducting more surveys isn't really an option in, for most of our stocks. Um, there, there are additional funds coming under the Inflation Reduction Act that can be used to fill some targeted holes and conduct some additional surveys, but those are short-term funds and we really need to be thinking about this in a, with a long-term view. Uh, Kate mentioned yesterday that passive acoustic monitoring could help us fill some of this hole and has already for a number of stocks providing um, indications of rain shifts and how animals have moved around relative to climate. Um, and they can fill a lot of uh, temporal holes, particularly in the context of um, fixed passive acoustic networks that exist all throughout the country. Um, and as we start using other new passive acoustic tools, they can fill some of these spatial gaps as well. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later. But I guess my sh very short take home to this of how do we adjust our assessment surveys, and by this I'm talking about our, our NOAA white ship surveys, is to make the most of our survey opportunity. And, and that sounds kind of flippant, but um, back when I was a graduate student at Scripps, um, associated with the Southwest Fishery Science Center, their surveys incorporated all sorts of um, habitat and ecosystem measurements. Over time, those dwindled as uh, both the need for some of those measurements went away, could be replaced with remotely sensed, and also just the cost of conducting that kind of work. But I think there's some new tools now that we need to be investigating. And, and with this, I want to just highlight this one survey, the 2018 survey uh, along the West Coast, which due uh, primarily to ship time limitations and scheduling constraints was coupled with the Coastal Pelagic Fish Survey. Um, but it ended up providing this really amazing opportunity to look at um, habitat hotspots relative to humpback whale distribution, um, resulting in this great paper by Angela Sizorka and the other colleagues at Southwest Center. Um, as an example of how this um, same time, same space, um, more full ecosystem sampling of, during our assessment surveys could really yield interesting outcomes. Uh, there's another example of this that we're piloting right now. Um, we've incorporated some um, food web eDNA surveillance into our Hawaiian Island Cetacean and Ecosystem Assessment Survey that's uh, running right now. Uh, so far, it's included 20 uh, 20 CTD casts um, where there's a, a replicate sampling. Um, between 20 and 160 meters, and then those samples are being run to detect uh, marine mammals, fish, plankton, and cephalopods, um, hoping to, and then care, uh, quantifying that against some net toes to try to understand if this could be a, pop, a good surveillance tool going forward. So how can we adjust our assessment analyses to detect and incorporate climate impacts? And, and here, um, Density surface models are a, a widely available and widely used tool, and they've been developed for many Pacific and Atlantic stocks, um, but they aren't necessarily universally used to inform stock assessment reports by the agency. And, and there's a few good reasons for that, um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And then um, additional marine mammal detection data could improve model precision and enable development of density models for data poor stocks. 
So uh, this is an example, again, from my colleagues at the Southwest Fishery Science Center, where they use density surface models to predict the distribution changes under anomalous conditions. And this is really driven by um, a lot of hard work by Elizabeth Becker and Karen Forney and others to figure out what are the right uh, variables to incorporate into these models. And in this case, they've built um, models for eight species based on two decades of survey data and then used those models to predict on what would happen in 2014, a year of anomalous warm period, and how well did the model work out. And uh, one great example, a well-parameterized model for common dolphins captured a threefold increase in density oh, shoosh, um, within the study area in 2014. And that, that exceeded any conditions or density um, estimates that had ever been observed for that stock. Um, but there is some caution here in that when species habitat relationships aren't well understood or might be dynamic, the model does poorly. And in this case um, of striped dolphins, the model predicted a, a modest increase in population density off the California current during this 2014 period and in fact resulted in a significant underestimate of true density that was observed. So one way of improving the models, um, integrating passive acoustic data into the models can reveal important demographic and behavioral differences. And a good example of this is from my colleague Yvonne Barkley, part of her PhD dissertation, looking at um, using the passive acoustic detections of sperm whales and integrating those into the SDM. Um, it not only increased the number of observations by um, several times, but also enabled the ability to detect to characterize those in encounters based on whether the animals were foraging or not foraging and building separate models. And so with that, um, I will say that the SDMs for sperm whales that don't include acoustic data in Hawaii are quite terrible. Um, and these are quite a significant improvement in terms of now really being able to look at how the two different groups distribute differently and ultimately create a stronger assessment. So new opportunities to detect and integrate climate-induced changes in stock assessments. So here I'm going to talk about um, really some new opportunities available to us under with this sort of pulse of Inflation Reduction Act funding that the agency um, is hopefully just poised to take advantage of. And three of those, um, leveraging NOAA's Climate Ecosystems and Fisheries Initiatives. I asked Patrick Lynch how he pronounces this, but I'm going to say Cefi. Um, Developing survey designs that employ uncrewed marine systems and advancing analysis approaches that can incorporate diverse data sets. So leveraging CEFI, so CEFI, uh, as its name implies, is really a fisheries initiative intended to improve the quality of fish assessments um, and fisheries ecosystem assessments. But that doesn't mean that those um, vast improvements can't be used for protected species assessment work. And in fact, um, as those CEFI um, modeling areas are being developed now. Now is the time for us to weigh in on where those can be most useful for us going forward. So the goal of CEFI is to operationalize regional ocean models with roughly four to eight kilometer resolution, um, and then with corresponding decision support teams that incorporate oceanographic, ecosystem experts, economists, and social science to build this layered approach of habitat and distribution maps all the way down to ecosystem-wide forecasting forecasts and projections. So the, the distribution maps and the food web forecasts that come out of these should be should we be able to be incorporated into our model density and distribution and also can help us make some decisions about survey location and focus for species where we have particular concerns. Um, Another, as one of the strategic initiatives under the Inflation Reduction Act, we will be pursuing integration of uncrewed marine systems into assessment surveys. And this is really billed as an opportunity to expand our assessment efforts um, while hopefully eventually reducing our dependence on NOAA's white ships. But, but they also have this uh, particular advantage in that um, they're collecting ecosystem, the gliders are collecting ecosystem data alongside the passive acoustic data. Um, and so sort of this again paired um, paired sampling that can be quite important as we start to build models with the data, but also we can send the, the gliders off to wherever we want them to sample and we aren't tied to the, the capabilities of ship. So over the next few years, we're gonna be um, doing testing of four different gliders, uh, the well-known sea gliders and slocum gliders, as well as two new gliders, um, the Heffering uh, Ocean Scout and the Alcimar Sea Explorer. 
Um, the goal is to deploy those during two large-scale multi-species um, cetacean surveys off the West Coast in 2024 and in Hawaii in 2025. Um, and have those gliders, they'll, there'll be a suite of eight to nine gliders all together surveying during the course of these surveys, um, these large scale visual surveys um, that we can use as a really great opportunity for validating the glider observations in terms of the larger scale cetacean survey effort. Um, they're also gonna be using a whole suite of different acoustic um, acquisition platforms, which will then enable us to provide recommendations moving forward about the best choice of not only glider hardware, but acoustic data acquisition hardware, because those decisions might not be the same depending on the region or the species that you're trying to survey. Um, and last, um, data integration. So there's been some great examples already. I showed you um, Yvonne's work on sperm whales. We've just this year been able to do density estimates for Cuvier's and Blainville's beaked whales in the Marianas using acoustic data sets um, driven largely by advancements um, that Jay Barlow led at the Southwest Center. Um, but um, another one other piece of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act funding um, under the passive acoustic arm of the strategic initiatives is going to be going towards um, how do we build out the assessment models to really be able to best use the type of data that are coming in off of these passive acoustic systems. They're not necessarily apples to apples of the visual survey data. Some are better suited than others, uh, line transect data, or I mean, uh, towed array data, for example, but others are quite different in how they survey the space. And we're really going to have to think a bit more about um, how to use those data going forward. Of course, this could apply to any other type of data set, uh, telemetry, satellite detections of whales. Um, but again, I owned my biases when we started. So um, so with that, thanks again for the invitation. Thank you, Jason, for um, convincing me that I should come and talk about this. <laughs> um, and again, to my other assessment colleagues for their input. All right, that was amazing. Um, I know you didn't get a lot of feedback from people, but obviously you had some ideas. All right, our final talk this session is from Raven Cunningham from the Chugach Regional Resource Commission. And let me find it. Oh yeah, here we go. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, La Raven Aduchte E Tahunk Alhu. Hi, my name is Raven Cunningham. I am Iak Alaska Native and I'm from Cordova, Cordova Alaska. Uh, I am the Tribal Fish and Wildlife Director at the Chigat Regional Resources Commission or CERC. Uh, the Chugach Regional Resources Commission, or CERC, represents the seven communities of the Chugach region and has been the traditional homelands for over 10,000 years. The Chugach region includes over 5,000 miles of coastline, 50 named islands, and over 20,000 mi square miles of mountains. On behalf of our seven communities, CERC has been working uh, towards assuming the responsibility and authority to exercise our indigenous rights as stewards of our marine mammals. Inherently, coastal Alaskan natives respect, conserve, and manage our marine resources while protecting the hunt, traditional uses, and local habitat. The MMPA establishes responsibility for managing and conserving marine mammals, and as in the 1994 amendments, it states that there's a federal responsibility to negotiate uh, co-management agreements with Alaska Native organizations. CERC does not currently have a co-management agreement, and no and no other ANO has a jurisdiction of our area, um, so we're tirelessly trying to create this role for marine mammal management um, to develop harvest management plans, enhance co-management strategies, and conduct surveys that provide necessary data for all. Chugachamak is Sukstun and is uh, translated into our region's ocean and the contents within it. This project is bringing tribal voices to the management process while informing future research and management to protect our marine mammals and safeguard cultural, economic, and subsistence needs. Uh, 
Our pilot project started in 2021 uh, with funds from the Marine Mammal Commission, NDN Collective, and Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy. This helped identify methods um, for future co-management and develop a baseline methodology for our program to build internal capacity to perform scientific research. We were able to develop an extensive research protocol that is guided by principles that protects our tribal members and their knowledge we also hosted two workshops that had 10 identified marine mammal harvesters or knowledge holders that participated in intensive interviews and contributed to CERC's understanding of marine mammals within the region and worked towards guiding our staff on what culturally competent co-management should look like. During this pilot, we accumulated real-time uh, and historical marine mammal and environmental condition data from semi-directed inter ethnographic interviews, participant surveys, and documented eyewitness accounts. This data has been separated into categories of ecological changes, marine mammal health, and other concern, oh, sorry, marine mammal distribution behavior and habitat changes, changes to marine mammal health and other concerns. The traditional territory of the EAC people from Knoll's Head to Ockley Split, including Hinchinbrook Island, um, was the study area, and the numbers and colors correspond to the detailed observations about sea otters, harbor seals, stellar sea lions, and climate change. This activity helps CERC better understand what the impacts of climate change will, uh, will happen for this part of the region, and identified areas of interest and importance to the tribal community, and uh, helps our programs take a closer look at these um, issues or um, identified areas. Throughout this project, we were, we've were we been working with ADF&G to compile existing qualitative data from the subsistence harvest surveys that took place from 1987 to 2014. And the reason they stopped in 2014 was because Exxon Valdez oil spill money was um, providing the funding for those. And then they quit doing that in 2014, um, quit funding those, those surveys. Um, this uh, this represents each species of interest and environmental changes, and then also Exxon Valdez oil spill because that had uh, significant impacts to our marine mammal harvest and um, separated the information then into topics and individual communities. We also summar summarized the quantitative marine mammal data from the region per community over those years. For example, this um, graph shows the percentage of households of Anand Wallach that um, harvested marine mam mammals from that 1987 to 2014. It shows on there that only 14 to 35% of people actually um, harvested marine mammals in that year, but up to 90% actually used marine mammals. So that highlights the importance of sharing resources throughout the community. We redesigned the existing marine mammal harvest surveys so that they provided data that we can use for management while still reflecting um, data collected from the old surveys so that it can be comparable to the survey now. ADF and G did say that they're going to start using the survey for their sub, uh, future subsistence harvest surveys throughout the coastal Alaska. In addition, we have also established a standardized biosampling program using well-established Alaska Native Harbor Seal Commission and Aleut Community of St. Paul's Indigenous Sentinel Network protocols. This is uh, this biosampling program aims to evaluate the risk to tribal members who have regular contact with marine mammals through subsistence use and have an understanding of the health of marine mammal populations in the Chugach region. With the help of ISN, we're working towards using an on, this online application to house the citizen science har harvest and sampling data. And this provides a tool for remote communities to participate in sharing real-time data for future in-season management. And this application is also privacy protected for both online and mobile apps. Um, and then and tribes and individual hunters have data over ownership and control of what is being shared. Part two of this project um, is obtaining population data for harvest management. Current stock assessments of sea otters, harbor seals, stellar sea lions are not accurate enough for harvest management based on indigenous knowledge and um, consistencies of surveys taking place. Population surveys are conducted, are required to be conducted um, every eight years, according to the NOAA GAMS, which was presented earlier today. Uh, for the and um, sorry. Uh, and population 
uh, for the purposes of local needs, uh, stock sur surveys and stock assessments, um, they're not being conducted frequently enough. Um, for our knowledge holders from the workshop described concentrations of sea lions and seals in places and at times not evident on annual surveys. And in addition, local uh, commercial fishermen need information on a finer scale um, or different seasons to judge judge potential interactions with seals and sea lions, for example, like them stealing the catch or getting it entangled in gear. So here is a, the um, set of harbor seal haulouts that are currently being cataloged. This is um, from the 2019 stock assessment report. And according to them, um, there's been reduced funding uh, since 2015, which has limited the scope of surveys being done in our region. And these efforts and funding have been um, focused in regions with more specific conservation in interests like the Aleutian Islands. Um, the latest Prince William Sound survey was in 2015. And um, the most recent Harbor Seal Stock Assessment Report areas were done in 2019, 17, 15, 2012, and 11. Um, CERC and our tribes believe that these surveys are not being conducted during the right time of year to inform harvest management appropriately. For instance, they're done in the uh, summer months when seals are swimming and diving at sea chasing salmon instead of the early spring when they're hauled out on ice, pupping, and sunning. Um, this is a set of uh, data points for um, haulouts and um, rookeries for sea lions. Uh, the surveys that were done for this were done in July, June and July of 2013, 15, 17, 2019, and 2021. Um, according to the stock assessment reports that are current through 2020, um, due to climate change and need for new food sources, we don't think that these haul-out sites are current. And I think that there needs to be more Indigenous representation um, and input on where these new haul-outs and rookeries are due to climate changes, new food sources. They've been changing over time. And so I think that should be inputted into um, future stock assessments. For sea otters, based on um, their stock assessment reports, uh, for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they were described in the USGS South Central Survey Report that there hasn't been a cohesive region-wide South Central Survey since 1989. That's a long time. On the map, you can see that the areas have, there have been areas that have been surveyed, um, but it's not been consistent. And the ones in parentheses were not included in the stock assessment surveys, whether it wasn't ready for publishing or um, it wasn't, the data was too old or what have you. Uh, these surveys are leveraged by the Gulf Watch of Alaska's long-term monitoring program. And this is important to know because the current stock assessment reports have uncertainty since surveys are not being done consistently. Um, we can't calculate the PBR. However, this can be easily resolved with partnerships and funding, which we have all been saying. Um, we are also, um, Located in a, uh, CERC has the capacity to do more frequent surveys, and I think that it's really important that we acknowledge co-management agreements um, because Native organ organizations usually are in the area where these these assessments need to be done. So we have a we are located right in Cordova and in Seward, so we have access to be able to survey um, areas for several days or a week or are too, in order to make sure that we're catching peak numbers or accurate representation of the population um, of that year. It's also important to recognize that federal, federal managing agencies, laws, and enforcement are not consistent, and it's very hard to navigate co-management because of that. For example, the sea otter stock represents the South Central Chugach region boundaries. However, seals and sea lions are not represented or managed the same. Our project highlights that if there's current, currently no co-management jurisdictions in an area, then regional management units should follow INCSA regional corporations for proper indigenous co led co-management. Um, think of it like land mammal hunting. Uh, boundaries um, are very important for concert wildlife conservation and so that animal stocks are managed appropriately um, within those specific habitats um, so that we can understand overabundance or underabundance and how, how we manage that. Um, having such large stock areas makes it very difficult to manage a resource. I also want to acknowledge that there's very many excellent examples of co-management um, agreements in Alaska. These success 
successes have shown that effective management and conservation through agreements between tribal and federal managers provide intangible benefits um, and gained through these active partnerships. Co-management is the only tool that can be used uh, before a marine mammal species becomes depleted or comes to a strategic state. It's the path of being proactive rather than reactive. Lastly, I want to acknowledge why this program got started under CERC, and um, it's because of the continuation of my people and all, uh, like all Alaska Natives, to be able to harvest marine mammals for the purposes of food, subsistence, and handicraft. Um, we need to remove the barrier posed by the quarter blood quantum requirement for, from those re federal regulations. Hunting, proper hide preparation, and skin sewing are all essential components to the identity of my people. These skills are handed down from generation to generation, and the, but the reality of today is that with each successive generation, our blood quantum continues to decline. Today, over 60% of tribal members within my region are under a quarter blood quantum. And there was a statistic done, I forgot who it was done by, but within the next 100 years, over 60% of the state of Alaska is going to be under a quarter blood quantum. Many feel uncomfortable to participate in these cultural activities or fear the consequences if they're caught. Then there's others like myself that don't want to let anything get in the way of practicing our culture and heritage. We all want this change to happen and it affects every single one of us. But the concern that I see is if there, if this was to happen right now and we took blood quantum out of the federal regulations with no co-management in place, there'll be huge ramifications. The Chugach region has four access points, as you're going to see on this map, um, and they all lead to urban areas. If we open hunting to more Alaska natives, we have the possibility of having a huge influx of new hunters coming to our region to hunt. Funding needs to become available from NIMPS and U.S. Fish and Wildlife to support co-management agreements for the regions that do not have management. If we create these relationships, changes to blood quantum won't be as drastic to marine mammal populations. New hunters will be held accountable to the harvest management plans that fall under the co-management agreements. Lastly, I have been asked by the tribe specifically to emphasize this. The challenges we are facing with inadequate funding and resources for po population monitoring, um, we would like to harvest marine mammals according to a management plan that is specific that has specific goals and criteria criteria, but the success of any management plan is going to be impossible without, without access um, to solid ongoing population monitoring. And I just want to say thank you um, to our funders, our collaborators, especially our executive director at CERC, Willow Hetrick. She's been a huge supporter for me and this work that I've been doing, as well as our science director, Miley Branson. It really shows how we could take Western science and indigenous knowledge and create a really great project and program. Um, and specifically, I want to thank my hunters and my elders and my knowledge holders in our communities because they've given me the confidence and support to speak here on behalf of all of them. And I really genuinely appreciate that I'm speaking with a um, hundred people behind me. So thank you. Thank you, Raven. That was absolutely a spectacular end to this amazing session. Um, I want to thank all the speakers, maybe a round of applause for everyone. We have uh, 25 minutes, roughly. Three o'clock is when we need to be back. Oh, there's going to be a picture. I forgot about that. Thank you. Uh, some of us have 25 minutes. Others of us are going to have our photos taken. But uh, you have that time to digest and think about everything you've heard, and we'll be back for an hour of discussion. Thanks. I think we have to
It is three o'clock, so we are going to get started yeah. right now. Um, all right, so hopefully everyone has had an opportunity to to digest what you've heard and to think of some great discussion topics. We have a few that we are going to uh, kick this off with, uh, but um, we'll see where it goes. Uh, the first question I want to direct to to Raven and uh, to Dave, if he wants to follow up also, um, is about how can tribally led assessments, harvest management plans, and collaboration between co-management partners and the respective federal agency account for climate change effects to marine mammals within Marine Mammal uh, Protection Act stock assessment. So that's that's a mouthful, but you've got it there in front of you as well. Um, take it away, Raven. I think I'll just reference my presentation when I was talking about um, you know the stock assessments that have been done previously and our um, input on them. Uh, one of them being, um, you know, as uh, climate is changing, um, food options are changing for marine mammals, um, you know, not in our area, well, in our area, ice sheets are melting and, and they're going in places that they haven't really been before. And, and the people who are doing the stock assessments don't live in our day-to-day lives experiencing and having relationships with these animals and knowing where they're at and so they're still just um, doing the assessments on the historically known spots um, having that indigenous input i think is really important because we're knowing where those new where those stocks are going into those new places um you know food food options have changed and for example um you know we have the hatcher the pink salmon hatcheries um in our sound and if you want to know where all the marine mammals are going, they're going right outside those hatcheries. <laughs> they know it's like clockwork right when they release those salmon fry with their mouths open. That would be a great time to do some stock assessments <laughs> for base. Yeah, looking at the harvest management plan framework, I think the most efficient way for this to enter would be to uh, through the sustainable harvest level um estimate and so let me explain a little bit about what that is if that wasn't clear from my talk so uh, it would replace pbr in this framework and the way sustainable harvest level estimates work through the harvest risk assessment efforts are you have an abundance estimate hopefully derived the right way incorporating indigenous knowledge have the local and regional input and buy-in and engagement you have an abundance estimate then you go through the harvest risk assessment process to look at um that different levels of risk managers may want to accept on harvest levels, depending on where the state of the population is or is trending. And so the one we did, I say we, I wasn't around for it, and the Chukchi did just that and looked at uh, 30, 35 years in the future and looked at changes in K based on uh, sea ice projections to look at this harvest level that they came up with that was approved by the U.S. Russia Commission at 42 and a half bears and there's a few caveats there right you gotta the agreement is you got to have regular monitoring in place and you have to have and that includes abundance estimates on a regular interval and you have to have a really good measure of what removals are and so i think that's probably the fastest way for this to enter into the process all right thanks um i think next we'll just uh open up Questions to commissioners. Andy. I have questions. I have a lot of questions, but I know we have limited time, so I'm only going to ask two. Um, my first one's to Aaron, and you alluded to this in passing in your presentation, but didn't really delve into it. Um, and that is what happens when climate change and climate variation results in varying carrying capacity and how do we deal with that in the stock assessment process first one okay well i i i am going to punt to my partner over there at the end <laughs> of the table for the most part but um just to say that um i mean it is a, of an interesting topic i mean the the paper by Josh Stewart looking at eastern pacific gray whale boom and bust as you know he put in his title um, and then the calculation of annually varying K 
uh, you know, kind of opened up a lot of questions about what does that mean in the context of you know, removals from anthropogenic sources and how we compute PBR and is PBR capturing all of the right things? And how do we do OSP assessments with annually varying Ks? So um, I don't know the answer, but I think it's it's going to be a guiding question among you know our stock assessment colleagues in the very near term. And but I do know that Eric has an opinion on this as well. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, so I think it's a it's a great question, Andy, and we're we're starting to ask it ourselves a lot and think about it, particularly in light of Josh's paper. But it's certainly been um, something folks have been thinking about. I think. With respect to OSP, it, it it seems daunting to me to try to manage to an annual varying OSP. We can rightfully say that we are, it's a challenge to manage to an OSP that um, would be stable over time. So I don't think that that's, as, at least from a management perspective, that that would be uh, a good approach. Um, so then what is what is OSP and what do you do about this varying climate change? And um, I've looked a little bit into this and tried to talk to some folks and it, to some level, it, it should be um, it, it should be bound to the life history of the species that you're looking at in terms of what is the target. Um, and so annual, it might make sense for an insect, but it's not going to for marine mammal. Um, so I think we need to think about that a lot and how that impacts um, our assessments with relative to OSP, I think will be challenging. Um, we don't do, uh, as you probably know, a lot of OSP assessments. Um, the whole goal and the hope is that PBR will get us there without having to do with the OSB assessments. So um, I don't know the answer. Um, I do think that the, the fact that we look at our stock assessment reports, generally speaking, on an annual basis is a good thing. Um, I also think that that could mean that we would not see small changes here or there and over time they add up. And if we look back, we missed something big because we were looking at the puppy grow into a dog, right? So I, I think it's a real challenge that we're going to have to grapple with over the next few decades to, to half century to figure out how do we deal with that. So I don't have a good answer, but a lot of thoughts have gone into that and we're continuing to have some of those conversations. But if you have thoughts. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's have, let's continue that conversation because I think it's important and, and interesting and I don't know the answer either. But so my second related question is for Dave, and that's what happens when in a case where we suspect or we know that carrying capacity is changing in a directional manner. So in this case, think about, as you said, as you alluded to, um, moving towards an ice free Arctic, longer fasting periods, which means reduced fecundity for female bears, which essentially means reduced carrying capacity for those bears. And yet the surveys are imprecise, the surveys are not conducted as regularly as we would like to. And so the assessment may not be catching up to what the environment is driving the population. So in, in your in your world, how how do you view that and, and, and how do we deal with a K that might be declining rapidly? Our world that causes lots of anxiety, the situation you just described. Yeah, I think uh, the abundance estimates right now and the frequency of them it's a problem, but it's not it's not a fixable problem currently, uh, given funding cycles and where we are right now. We're looking at, at like global populations worldwide. Once a polar bear generation, about once every ten to fifteen years, I think, is pretty ambitious. You know, we spoke to our USGS colleagues, and I, I said it with you know kind of a half smile. I'm like, we'd like those every every six years for the Southern Beaufort Sea. You know, and I knew it was an unreasonable request. Um, there's no good answer to those challenges. I think what we're doing now in the Fish and Wildlife Service is trying to make sure we understand exactly what the removal rate is, the most precise way possible to make sure that harvest can occur for as long as possible, as long as it's sustainable. The other things we just got up, like we're trying to, we're trying to resume work in the Chukchi again this year, but let's be clear, the exact same factors that are causing us problems, deteriorating ice conditions are going to limit and remove our ability to monitor those populations, at least as we used to do it traditionally. So there's that too. We think we have a little more time in the Chukchi, but that still doesn't make you, you know, sleep well at night. So I don't have a good answer for anything other than we're, we're aware, we're working, we're trying, and we're working with our last night partners to do better, but there's just no real good, easy solution to those challenges. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, first, I just want to thank you all for your presentations, all very interesting and really quite a range of ecological scales, if you will, that we're talking about. Aaron, you brought it up particularly in the fact that we've mostly focused on the EEZ, but that's a total artificial 
line. And so from an ecology point of view, I always struggle with some of these calculations because you do have animals, bears in the Chukchi Sea, and yet that population seems to be doing pretty darn well with that sea ice loss. You wouldn't expect that. It, it's a clear loss of habitat that is very important to a polar bear, and yet the Chukchi population is doing quite well. With regard to the gray whales, you they're not really reliant on those benthic amphipods anymore in the northern Chukchi Sea because they're not there. And so linking it so tightly, as was done in that paper, I think you're missing the fact that gray whales are prey switching to krill. Um, and so this doesn't really lead to a question exactly, but then to Raven's presentation, you have these big areas that, that Noah's looking at for these stocks, and yet you know that locally the harbor seals are using, you know, different haul outs and going to the fish hatchery, you know, whenever that's the right time to go. So I'm not really helping here, but I'm just wondering how perhaps with, uh, again, more uh, in Alaska co-management approaches in terms of getting that indigenous knowledge included is, is very key. Out in the Pacific, the development of other tools, I'm, I would be very interested in how you might use both gliders and perhaps fixed instruments and things like that to at least detect phenological changes, timing changes, because that's that's been very effective for us in Alaska is using acoustics for that. So um, again, I thank you. I know these aren't really specific questions, but if you have any response back, please. Yep, yeah. Raven. I have a response. I think that, um, you know, as you're speaking, something that comes to my mind is resiliency. And I think all that what all these animals have in common is being resilient to these changes. And something that I don't think many people have really looked at, but our region has, is the impacts of Exxon Valdez had to our region. It's not exactly the same because it was a human-made incident, um, but it's still impactful. And looking at the repercussions and the what has happened, you know, years past and how is the environment recovered? Um, I think that's something that we need to look at at climate change is looking at Exxon and looking at how that has changed our region and how it's overcame that. I wouldn't say it's completely overcame because we can still dig and find oil, but she's healthy and animals are recovering. Fish populations are recovering. I think that we need to look at climate change in that same, same instance. Yeah. And maybe include resiliency in our thinking in terms of this overall process. I'm out of my debt, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did have a couple of questions for, for Erin. One about, you did mention the EZ, so I was curious about international collaborations for um, assessing animals that you're pretty sure have gone sort of outside the EZ. Are there formal arrangements? Is that an area that we should be thinking about? And then a totally different, just Brian Smith yesterday mentioned um, cetaceans perhaps using a deep canyon refugia to thermoregulate. I was wondering what evidence, do you have evidence of that happening or is that a, a hypothesis at this point? Well, second question first. No, we don't have any yeah. evidence of that, but um, but we're a pretty data limited region. I mean, the, the scale of the data we would need to be able to even hypothesize about that isn't something that I have the luxury of holding. Um, but to international agreements, I mean, I feel like it is, it's very stock or species specific. So Western North Pacific gray whales, or not gray whales, humpback whales, for example, you know, a, a small portion of the wintering range is in U.S. waters in the Marianas. The, a lot of the summer range is in U.S. waters in Alaska, but otherwise it's in Russia and Japan and the Philippines. And so the, I wouldn't say there are um, explicit written down agreements. It's it's just a matter of you know, building those partnerships and um, building the trust and then building the tools that enable those collaborations to happen. And um, thinking from a very data-centric perspective, tools like Happy Whale have really now opened up the possibilities of those kinds of collaborations without necessarily needing to do, you know, the the output of what you can get from it is, is more evident um, and it helps you make the linkages to the right people that are going to pr provide a product or provide an assessment that's a little bit more comprehensive. But um, for cetacean, you know, transboundary stocks in the middle of the Pacific, there's there's not really, um, you know, a neighboring partner for me to call up and ask them how their assessments are. So 
um, really different scales, I think, of challenges to be managed. If I if I can just add a little bit to that. Um, so from a national perspective, um, we are starting to try to move away from assessing in artificial boundaries such as the EEZ. In fact, our most recent revisions to our, our GAMs um, essentially does away with that and then realizes that we need to be assessing at the true biological population level to the extent that we can. Um, and as Aaron mentioned, in some places that's really difficult. In other places, like for North Atlantic right whales, we do a pretty good job of assessing internationally. Um, and there are quite a lot of agreements, uh, both informal and formal, with the government of Canada. So I think to Aaron's point, it is really specific right now, at least uh, on the situation. Um, and a lot of it depends on what the part, you know, are there partners there to partner with and how willing are they to partner? Um, but we do do uh, our best uh, is where we can um, to not limit our assessments. Um, to the EEZ or, or other artificial boundaries to recognizing that the animals are, of course, not going to respect those. I didn't think I had the brains to ask a question, but that did raise a question, <laughs> which is if you, you talked about the uh, addition in the GAMS of the language that allows to talk about other factors. If you were to take the example of the North Atlantic right whale, stock assessment is basically any of that other stuff just basically taken care of by the standard stock assessment process. So it's sort of like we can talk about including these elements, but what is the, you know, what, how much is that going to push or change a stock assessment report? And maybe that goes to Matt, your vulnerability assessments, you know, it's like, what would we do that would create actually a significant change in the stock assessment, the PBR and all the way down the road? Or what What would we, you know, what would change that coming from the climate change perspective? I can take a stab and then turn to Matt if he wants. Um, so the North Atlanta right whale star is a good example um, in that in more recent years, we have been starting to include a lot of additional information in large part because of the unusual mortality event that's ongoing and the additional information we get from that investigation. So um, we have been now, as I think you're aware, Peter, tallying and keeping track of some lethal injuries, illness, um, things that are not by MMPA standards, mortality or serious injury that count against PBR, but certainly are affecting the population. Um, and in many ways might show up in terms of reproductive rates. So um, we can certainly and are talking about those in the SARS. Um, that doesn't right now change PBR. It doesn't right now directly result in significant changes to management action other than to paint the overall picture that the species is in crisis. Um, that being said, um, there are potential ways where um, those could potentially be reflected in, say, the PBR language, not directly as in, in numbers, but in terms of changes in some of the default values that we use, for example. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there because I think Matt might talk a little bit about that too. But um, certainly bringing them in as a starting point to, to recognize that they're there and discussing them um, is, is where we got to start. And we're starting to do that more. Um, I will say the, the GAMs, uh, directed us better to do it. Um, it was we could always do it. It was always allowed by the statute. We weren't just maybe not as specifically as aligned with the way one seventeen is written as we as we are now with those other factors. But Matt, do you have thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, and on the the boundary question, um, one thing that that we did to deal with that is we used the stock definitions and then also included instruction for our scorers to include information from the adjoining area. So if it's a stock that we know leaves this boundary, if it's a stock that we know goes outside of the EEZ, to also include the information from where we know that they're going to. <clears throat> um, and uh, a related point to that, and it's something that Eric had kind of touched on in, in his presentation, is that the definition of the stock is really, really important to these assessments. Um, in, I believe it was 2020, there was a, a global species level uh, vulnerability assessment for marine mammals looking solely at the, the species level. And when we compared our results to that, we found some, some very different uh, results, particularly at those stock levels, um, thinking about common bottlenose dolphins. So we found a lot of our base down in estuary and also the Atlantic estuarine common bottlenose dolphin stocks to be 
vulnerable to climate change. And a lot of that's driven by highly resident behavior, small population sizes, lots of cumulative stressors. But if you look at the species level, they were found to be fairly resilient. Um, and if you look at the offshore populations, we, we saw that same kind of finding that they're fairly resilient, not as vulnerable. Um, and so that definition of, of what is the stock is, is really important to the findings. And I think that's that's probably something that uh, we see in the stock assessment reports is where that boundary is and how you delineate the stock is, is really important to how that, that stock is um, categorized. So I, I think that's a, a finding that goes between both of the, the vulnerability assessments and the stock assessment reports. Um, and I don't know if, if necessarily anything would change um, with climate change, but being consistent with, with how we're applying these methods um, between the, the two, I, I think is very important so that we're operating on or, or our discussions are surrounding similar groupings. Can I add to that? I actually have an example um, where following the change in the GAMS to not explicitly rely on the EEZ um, in the forthcoming pelagic, Hawaii pelagic false killer whale SAR, we've actually expanded the boundary of that stock to include pelagic areas to the east of Hawaii. And, and to be clear, we did not do that for climate reasons. We did that because we knew that the animals were in that space and we wanted to have a better accounting of fishery removals on the stock. But, um, you know, things don't always work in logical ways, but what, you know, by expanding that boundary, what it's now enabling is the opportunity to collect data across the stock range and better understand those ecological relationships outside of the Hawaiian archipelago, which really makes up maybe half of the total stock area. Um, and not be always responding to, you know, this survey says there's 200 whales and the next survey says there's 2000 and in really being able to look at it more holistically. So I think um, it sort of set us up for being able to do a better assessment of that stock in light of environmental and other impacts. So kind of building on, on Peter's question, I was wondering if I could get your thoughts on um, just more on how health can be incorporated in the stock assessments. And Eric mentioned, uh, you know, the things that they were doing with right whales. But I think back at um, some of the, like the Southeast and their stock assessment reports after DWH looked at the, the models that were linking health measures to reduce survival. And they actually incorporated that in their excess mortality and calculation of PBR. So is health potentially a pathway for linking climate change to population health to vital rates that would then quantitatively feed into the stock assessments? Yeah, so I'll take a stab. I think so. Um, the the deep water horizon example is a good one, but also a tricky one because there there's really pretty clear direct human impact that caused that reduction in survival mortality. So counting it against PBR makes a lot of sense and seems to be following in line with what the statute's directing us to do. Climate change is, is much harder, right? Um, being able to attribute a, a death of an animal directly, as, as sort of Jason said when he started this session, directly to the death of one animal, or any animals for that matter, is, is much more challenging. So um, I think there's opportunity there, though. Um, I think there's a variety of different uh, metrics and parts of PBR that could be thought about and looked at um, for potential changes. Um, you know, when the uh, first stock assessment reports were done, um, uh, and thereafter, we've had the default values for a lot of those that are based on reasonable science, but some of those defaults might need to be relooked at. Um, and are they the same for stocks that are highly vulnerable under climate change versus others? So um, an obvious one is the net productivity rate and R max is what we often refer to it. And should the defaults be changed based on vulnerability to climate? I don't know. I don't know the answer, but I think one could probably do some simulation analyses and look at that and come up with some uh, back of the envelope uh, advice on on how to go. So I think that could show up there, certainly to the extent that um, climate change is reducing a population size, that in theory should be reflected in its end minute, and that goes into PBR, and then so that would change our management scheme. Um, the recovery factor is a hard one, um, because there's a lot of flexibility in, in the recovery factor, and um, a lot of different interpretations on on how, how it could be used and how it should be used, um, but that's another one that could be looked at. So I do think there are quantitative ways that it could be brought in, um, I, I tend to, uh, I've had conversations with Jason before, and I'll, I'll lean on him a little bit here, that 
what I don't think would be particularly useful is exhaustive conversations and descriptions of climate change impacts in the SAR, because um, that won't really change that much. And for the most part, uh, the SARs are a really good, succinct summary of, of the best scientific available information on the species. Um, but yeah, just for everyone else's awareness, I think the, the Deepwater Horizon example is a great example of sort of estimating uh, mortality that you cannot see um, that was from a major event and then using that. And those stocks have been strategic for quite a while because of deep water horizon. Um, and that changes our management to some degree. So. Okay, since you mentioned me, I'll, I'll jump in just for a second to, um, sorry, Jason, just to, no, I, I appreciate it because that gives me a chance to insert myself. Um, so I, I, I will just sort of paraphrase the second point. Um, up there because I think that that fits in this discussion that we're just having. So there's kind of two approaches in my mind uh, to deal with climate change and stock assessments and broader uh, consideration of climate change impacts on marine mammals, not as part of stock assessments. So as we've been talking about, and Eric mentioned that, so if, if climate change indirectly reduces a population that should show up in the abundance estimate and implicitly climate change is then incorporated into the stock assessment process through those parameters that are measured. Another approach is to say everything like we were talking about, or Eric mentioned, everything we know about climate change, put it into the text of the stock assessment so people can know about it, but in reality, it has no management implications. There's no hook there to do anything differently because of it. So uh, the other approach, other than trying to squeeze everything into the stock assessment, is to look at things like the climate vulnerability assessments to prioritize, well, which of the species that we're dealing with uh, really need to have their stock assessment done next versus having some sort of research done or process research to understand what are the climate impacts. It's really prioritizing based on where the vulnerabilities and threats are. So yesterday, Mike Cameron was talking about ring seal or ribbon seals, and they think that they had two consecutive years where they may have lost the entire cohort that was born. So right, massive, right? So these that's a population that is close to, last estimate is close to 200,000 animals. I think he said that the previous survey was 2012, and they were gonna do it again, maybe in the next year or two. So I would submit that uh, they have almost no chance of detecting the impact of losing two cohorts by having two abundance estimates separated by that time and with probably very little, if no, if any information about age structure that might help give some clues about where a change is coming from. So at the same time, if you look at the, the, star, the SAR for ribbon seals, the fisheries takes are either zero or one every up and down the columns, right? So, so that is insignificant, but all of the effort, almost all of the effort of the agency for ribbon seals is going into getting that number and getting the stock assessment. Whereas what's languishing on the side are all the really big effects of climate change. So I don't, that's a, not an answer and not a question, but it's a point of discussion about which way is the most appropriate to go, put everything into the stock assessment model or address climate change through other aspects of the MMPA. And you're asking us, Jason. <laughs> I'll stop now. Um, are there other questions from, yeah. Okay, Mike. Yeah. Um... First, I guess an observation that kind of responds to some of the discussion we've had, which is the, and I'll characterize, you're, you've talked about it in terms of variable carrying capacity, and I'll kind of put it in the, the, the discussion we had with regards to polar bears, which was the spiraling K, where it's it's clear what direction it's going in and uh, and and. and what what it is and just an observation is yes it has implications for osp and those were addressed in the the polar bear conservation slash recovery plan and the 
three aides of the Marine Mammal Commission and the two management agencies represented here didn't come to unanimity. So anyone that's interested in that particular aspect might look at that discussion there. That's kind of the the, the shorthand version of, of at least the, the the different ways of looking at it. With, with that, I'll kind of turn to the what, what I view as the nuts and bolts of, of kind of the implications of uh the stock assessments which is the the management and legal aspects which is you you come up with a pbr and i agree that that and min is going to eventually take care of itself as the population declines so there'll be a time lag and uh, but but really Looking at the, the the two sides of the, I guess it's not an equation, but the two sides of the comparison is one is looking at at what point do you not rely on a default R max or a theoretical one, and you look at one that, uh, and you you touched on this, Eric, uh, uh, one that looks more at the re the reality and the situation, which is. Yes, theoretically, polar bears, let, let's say you have a declining trend like that. At, at what point do you say, we're not going to use a 4% R max or, or a 6% R max? We're, we're going to use something closer to what we're actually observing, or the, the theoretical has no uh, basis in reality. So, so you kind of touched on that, but, but I, I, I think that's kind of. The, the crux on that side and Aaron you kind of initially touched on the, the question of how, how do you attribute the the human caused mortality and serious injury and I'm thinking here of like HABs where we, we know they're occurring and how do you say part of this has a human cause behind it or, or since there I think this is a safe place to go since there are no manatee people up here, if you have non-point uh, pollution sources that are causing a, a, a die-off, how, how do you attribute that on the side of the equations? Because, yeah, there you can put a lot of good essay-type responses in, in your stock assessments, but at the end of the day, what really matters is what your PBR is and what how, how you characterize that human-caused mortality. So, so. I guess that's a comment, but it's also a question. Uh, to me, that seems like where where we need to be headed. Yeah, I'll jump in. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think in, in some cases, the defaults and even the theoretical, we need to reassess for our, from our RMAX as an example. We need to reassess in a climate change scenario, or even now, uh, as climate change is already having impacts, what are those? Um, so, so I, I think I agree wholeheartedly that that's, that's part of the equation. Um, but then as you noted, the other side is comparing it to the human cause mortality and serious injury. And so how do we, how, how does climate change come into play there? And that, that part to me, honestly, seems more challenging. Well, and, and maybe I'll, uh, uh, maybe un, uh, an unfair question for, for you, Dave, but, um, and because it was kind of done in the section seven context, but the, so, so some of the polar bear scientists recently came up with a how do we attribute the 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 human side of the the what's going on with polar bears to whether or not it's jeopardizing the the, the population how do you how essentially they were suggesting ways to tweeze out that human impact of climate change so such that you could look at it and and particular context of proposed federal actions. Yeah, the Amstrip and Bits paper was pretty, made a lot of noise, right? But functionally, nothing's changing for us from a regulatory standpoint right now. The memo that they referred to is still in place. The question is a good one, and it's merited. And um, the devil's in the details in that paper, you know, we're kind of uh, looking at it closely. To, to but get but, but I, I, I guess for the, the purposes of this discussion, the, the real question is how much of that is translatable to the, the attributing 
human causes to the, that side of the equation on, on mortality and serious injury. Oh, so you're not asking specifically about the paper necessarily. Yeah, but... but yeah, as a, as a brief for the paper, ties greenhouse gas emissions to changes in, in offspring survival, essentially. Um, I, I, I guess I'm not sure how that paper relates to the maybe the question you're asking, but... Maybe, maybe ask it again, Mike, so I, I kind of get what you're <laughs> uh, I, I guess they were suggesting a way to separate out the human cause aspects of climate change from other causes of climate yeah. change. And, and it seems to me that if you're looking at how to attribute human caused mortality and serious injury in the stock assessments, could you use that? Does that same type of approach apply to how you're going to characterize uh, and attribute human versus natural mortality in, in, in your SOC assessment reports? Oh, interesting. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, <laughs> the framework the framework they propose, like I said before, is is a good one, right? It's it's kind of getting at the the ultimate causation for loss of primary habitat, and that is greenhouse gas emissions and how that relates to offspring productivity, which would be this first thing to go. Um, as far as how we tie greenhouse gas emissions to human cause removals, I'm assuming that's what we're still talking about in the polar bear context. Yeah, it's complicated. I, you know, so it's globally listed, the species, uh, populations, depending on where you are, are doing different things, right? So um, Chuck GC is a great example you know, stable now looks to be okay. When is that going to change? I mean, some smart people, smarter than me, have noted that it's going to change. We just don't know when, given current sea ice changes. But I don't have, um, I wouldn't propose that framework right now without a lot more closer scrutiny. Let's put it that way. I don't know if that's a good answer to your question. It's the only one I got. <laughs> right. We got a question from Andy and then Robert. Yeah, maybe another question, but maybe a polemic. And so just I want to respond to what you would, uh, the uh, ICL argument you were, not the argument, but the example you were making to make a point. And I guess I'm interested in hearing from the assessment scientists. So, you know, when we think about Section 117 of the MMPA, it was specifically designed to address direct human removals, thinking specifically about fisheries bycatch. I was I'm old enough to remember, I testified in 1994, I remember that. And it feels like this discussion feels like we're trying to squeeze something that doesn't belong into a place where it shouldn't go. And Mike's intervention, I think maybe is a good example of that. So, so going back to your ICL example, so you're the assessment, you, I know you're not, Mike is, but you were the assessment biologist for that. You have a statutory obligation to pro provide a SAR and to do that. But you know that's not the driver of, what, of what's happening for that species or that stock. Maybe that so that's fine, and there there are, we need other levers to pull, and we shouldn't try and force this stuff that is not direct human serious injury and mortality into that into that into that system. So I'd like to hear what you think about that, and what Aaron thinks about that, and what Eric thinks about that. Yeah, I I kind of said what I think about it, which is that I agree with you. It 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 is sort of squeezing a round peg into a square hole, and um. I don't think it's going to result in the best conservation outcomes and that it would be good to use something like the cult, the climate vulnerability assessments to drive those those are basically setting up hypotheses based on expert opinion on what we think is true about these species lacking a lot of data about how they really are going to respond to climate change so we could use the, the vulnerability assessments to drive priorities for whether we do an assessment for this, for, for stock X versus do some other research that may uh, give us more information about really how are they responding to climate change? And then following that, are there interventions that are appropriate for that? But I wanna hear from others too. Yeah, um, so I, I tend to agree, um, but I have one caveat, which is I think that, you know, the PBR framework was set up to deal with um, a population that in theory would recover in the absence of direct human cause mortality. 
Um, but if the the default or what we at the time assumed those to look like, if that's no longer reality, and, and I come back to, to, to what Dave pointed out is that we're locked in to sea ice loss um, for the half century point to a certain amount. So if we were to take some default assumptions, say for polar bears, and then manage to that, the PBR framework to that direct, the direct human cause mortality and serious injury, if we're managing to something that's no longer a possibility, we're going to fail. So I think we need to reassess whether or not those sort of defaults can change. And I think that the, the beauty is that this framework is flexible enough to deal with that. Um, and that's why I would emphasize that we, you know, focus on how how it might make sense to think about climate change on the PBR side of thing as sort of our goal, and maybe our goals are changing because climate change is changing the future, but not focus so much on how can we attribute individual deaths of animals to climate change because, so what if an, a stock is strategic because of climate change? We don't have a lot we can do. Um, so it's just to me making sure we're like shooting for the right goalposts um, is kind of how I think about it. But otherwise, I would agree with you, Andy. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. And I actually remember back to a couple of uh, maybe uh, SR co collective SRGs ago when when Jason was making the argument that um, there shouldn't be a PBR for monk seals because monk seal decline wasn't governed by human caused mortality processes. And so the underlying assumptions of PBR just weren't appropriate in that context. And, you know, the statute says we must compute a PBR. So I think he now does. But but you know, what What does that PBR really mean? And and we really need to be taking a close look at where those stocks are that just, you know, have these greater environmental influences and that just looking at human cause mortality isn't really giving us the right outcome. Karen, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. I, I was kind of mulling a lot of these same thoughts and you guys have, have very well articulated a lot of those thoughts but I, I really do think that the the R max is the key parameter where um, taking your point that we don't want to fit a square peg into a round hole that's just not going to work but you know I do also remember the MMPA amendments and how they came about all the discussions and R max was always built on the assumption that there was some K that was far away and that these animals at low population sizes we're going to grow towards that. But what we're seeing now with climate change is K is collapsing. And so we're not ever going to be at a small population size relative to K because that K is moving and that whole paradigm really doesn't apply anymore. And But I, I could easily envision, um, you know, the, the, the statute locks us into this maximum theoretical language, but that's theoretical, including what theories. If if the theory includes that the climate is changing and therefore the population no longer can grow at what it could if resources were unlimited or, or and all that, then we could really come up with new R max as, as default values. And I think the the paper that was just discussed, and I confess I haven't read it, but having case studies, long term studies like what Randy does and, and with the right whales the, where we have some indication of mortality and impacts on demographic parameters that could be attributable to changes in the environment. We can do simulations similar to what Paul Wade did back in the in the 90s to say, OK, if the carrying capacity really is changing and we had this past default that was reasonable, how how much is that default going to be changing based on the changing K? and and I think that is a very tractable simulation that could be done. And I'm just for the record, I'm not volunteering. <laughs> but I, I that might be a place where we could bring this in. And it would only be the PBR side of the equation. It would not solve this question of how do we attribute the the the, the disappearing animals to human cause, but it could at least help us not get so far behind on both ends of the of the assessments. Thanks. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, this is a really interesting discussion, but before I jump into it, I wanted to thank Raven for talking about resiliency, that um, I don't think as humans, we give animals enough credit for being able to change how they use the world. Um, you know, they're not just gonna sit in one spot and die, you know, they'll wander off someplace. And, and I think that a good example of that is polar bears. And I think, the what was determined in 2006 or seven or eight whenever the, they were listed that they weren't given credit for being resilient and i think that's one of the reasons why they don't seem to be responding to sea ice loss the way it was thought back then um so like andy i'm and 
and Karen, I'm old enough to re to recall the discussions um, about these changes to the MMPA, and I'm young enough to actually remember some of the discussions. <laughs> and um, in Alaska, the the SARS and PBR was very clearly conveyed to subsistence hunters and subsistence communities that this was about commercial fishing and managing commercial fishing. So I think the questions that Mike asked, that the answers to those are what are we using PBR for? What are we using stock assessments for? What are we using? What are we trying to manage with those things? And I ask that because the PBR equation, even though it's really simple, that it's also really conservative. And then means that the population number that's used is really, really low. And I personally think that our max shouldn't be changed, even in the context of commercial fisheries. I think that F, uh, F uh, the recovery factor is a much more appropriate parameter to tweak um, if you want to deal with climate change issues. But I think it's a really important to uh, discussion to have. So, so my question for both NIMS and Fish and Wildlife Service is that it relates to how PBR is used. And because many people were told it's only about commercial fishing, that's what it's being used to manage for. But repeatedly, it comes up as a tool to manage subsistence. And, and because subsistence should be treated differently than commercial aspects of impacts to marine mammals, there needs to be a different tool, in my opinion. So, so my question is how are NIMS and the Fish and Wildlife Service using PBR? How are they talking to their co-management partners? Um, how are they giving co-management partners an opportunity to review SARS or review some of the specifics that are in SARS um, before it goes out to the public? How, how is that interaction occurring? Uh, and just your thoughts on, on those things would be great. I could try first. Yeah. It's always uncomfortable when someone asks what's the Fish and Wildlife Service is doing. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, I can tell you what we're doing. And I, I think fundamentally we agree, you know, this is, uh, you've heard me mention the sustainable harvest level estimates for both the subpopulations where we want, that's where we want to be, right? We want to have that replace PBR in the SAR for a lot of reasons. Uh, some of you have already mentioned a few times, because we're talking about harvest specifically and how it varies in space and time. Um, so maybe that's a short answer, or maybe the best answer for the PBR question you had. Uh, as far as review for stock assessments, um, the strategy, I haven't been around for the previous ones, but I can tell you where our strategy is for these, is that is the information in those assessments we share. There's no surprises to our co-management partners. They're, they're going to be well aware of the bumps and warts and the good and the bad. Um, now, regarding formal review, someone with experience could probably chime in on that. I don't know if we're allowed to do that outside of the public review period or not. Uh, but the idea is just not make sure there's no surprises during that public review period for our co-management partners. And I think that's the questions you had, Robert. Did I miss one? Okay. So, so I'm on the NIM side, but I'll, I'll caveat this with that. Uh, I'm just speaking from, from my views on this and, and my, my experience implementing and not necessarily speaking for the entire agency or everyone in it. Um, so with that being said, um, I, I think I have a little bit of a different view in that I think PBR has been successfully used if given the right parameters and adjustments to the parameters, and there's demonstration of this in the literature for subsistence. Um, I think it was employed in the MMPA with most people knowing and the intent being fisheries, but the fact is the way it's used and written in the MPA, MMPA is that we are to compare all human cause mortality and serious injuries. So we do need to make that comparison and that's what results in a stop being strategic or not. Having said that, the MMPA um, really only directs specific action in the event of being over PBR for commercial fisheries. So um, in the event that a stock, and we've had these situations where a stock is close to or over PBR to subsistence under NIMS jurisdictions, really what that in my mind should mean is that 
it's time to have a good conversation with our co-management partners. And obviously we should be having those conversations before we get there. Um, but it does not immediately result in any sort of regulation or anything to that effect. Um, I can understand that that's not necessarily um, the way that folks necessarily always want it to play out. Um, so I, I'm sensitive to that. But I'll say that I, I do think that there is an opportunity and option to engage co-management partners much earlier um, to before you ever even get there. And I'll note that, and I'm going to point to John Bankson, who's in the office, uh, in the audience in case he wants to add anything. But um, we did actually make some revisions to our, our GAMs most recently to try to explicitly lay out that we will work with our co-management partners at, in, around, or at, even before we engage with the scientific review group members which is before the public comment period. And as part of that, we are having them uh, review and help uh, provide information on what might be the best scientific information available to inform and calculate PBR. So I think we have to do it in the statute. We got to put it in there and we do and we will, even though Jason doesn't want to for monk seals. Um, but what it means at the end of the day is it's going to be very different depending on uh, the particular human impact that we're thinking about. Uh, reg, you know, dealing with. And uh, that, that gets back to the climate change discussion. If we were to say that a stock is strategic because of climate change, there's not a lot of teeth in there um, to actually do anything to that um, other than acknowledging it. Can I can I just follow up, Jason, just really, very briefly? Sure. Um, I, I wasn't trying to imply that subsistence harvest shouldn't be identified in the SARS, just what the, uh, the SARS or what PBR was being used to manage. And so you answered my question exactly what I was looking for. Okay, so thank you. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So I have a, a comment, not a question, so sorry. But um, I think we have to be talking about a variety of different tools to answer the questions that we need answered. And one tool we haven't talked about that I think is a really effective tool is climate scenario planning, um, because you can look across a bunch of different scenarios that might play out in an unknown future and look at what the sort of no regrets options are that you would take for management or what other actions you're taking. And I think it, it dovetails really nicely with the climate vulnerability assessment um, that Matt presented on. So just something to keep in mind that it's a tool in the toolbox that we can, I think, bring into play rather than trying to um, fit a, a square peg in a round hole or round hole or whatever you said that. <laughs> Mike, did you want to follow? Yeah, I, 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 I think the, the two gentlemen have resolved their 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 question, which which is yes, the the stock assessment reports do not have management implications for native subsistence. There's a, a separate process that that needs to be gone through, but that they can have public relations implications. So so the uh, I, I think that's not to be. Poo pooed, but but I also wanted to point out that there's a, a rare, rarely like never, but every every once in a while it's threatened to be used. That there's a separate provision of the stock assessment reports that give Alaskan natives a special right to challenge the information in them through formal rulemaking. So I think that yeah, you should try and avoid that by ha having your discussions before the fact but but there is is a remedy for for Alaskan natives there and, and I wanted to kind of transition and ask Raven a question based on your comment on blood quantum and and uh co-management authority but the, as we learned a hard lesson with Cook and that Blugas that that only works if the ANOs they you know, have jurisdiction and authority over all of the hunters and and that and that generally flows from from tribal village law and and who they have jurisdiction over so i just wanted to point out that i i think that's one shortcoming and make sure that you recognize that 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 you can you can have a co-management agreement but not everyone is bound by that that's very true. And I think something that, you know, needs to come with co-management is enforcement. And I think tribal enforcement should be something that's also funded. Um, maybe like a ranger program. They have a lot of examples in Australia that are really good at showing of indigenous groups um, managing resources over there. Um, I think, you know, we need to use the tribes that have 
tribal court systems. My tribe has one of is one of them. Um, the native village of Iak has a pretty well established court system, and also you know just supporting the the systems that are already there. You know the other groups that don't have co management is Southeast. They have lots of different. Um, uh, I guess, um, like groups down there that have like court systems and things like that. So there's, there's well-established, um, pieces in place. It's just taking those pieces of the puzzle and putting it together. And I think it's going to take some time and funding, um, the reoccurring conversation that keeps happening is funding, um, because nothing happens for free. But, um, I, I do think that, uh, if you have like those ranger programs set up and have the tribes leading those, um, there, there should be but, no issue with people following in alignment well, with the, those agreements. The, the, those tribal authorities only have jurisdiction over those tribal members. And what if you, you had a lot of red, red arrows of people hunting in other areas, if somebody yeah. comes down from Anchorage or over from Sitka and wants to hunt there right now. I, I, they're, they're, legally, there's very little you can do about that. Uh, as of right now, yes, you can't really yeah. do anything. Um, you're it's supposed within the Marine Mammal Protection Act. It says you're supposed to be with coastal dwelling, which is right. like within 50 miles. Um, I don't think everybody acknowledges that. Um, so there is people, you know, going out of bounds, which is you know. I don't know if that's within their rights or however you want to call it. It's a very gray area. Um, the the Marine Mammal Protection Act is very gray. Yeah, maybe um, we can follow up. After, yeah. yeah, I don't want to yeah. send us down this rabbit yeah. hole too far. I, I do think, though, um, co-management agreements, if you want to look at it in the sense of like state you know, hunting regulations, we have our different areas and people who want to come into that area have to abide by those rules for that, that hunt, you know, let's, for example, say Prince William Sound deer hunting, um, people from Anchorage, Wasilla, all over the state come into our region to hunt and with newer boats and accessibility, they are able to reach other places, they still have to abide by the five deer rule. They can't take more than five deer. They have to get their permits. They have to sign up. So I think um, as long as there's enough publicity out there about co-management and letting, you know, having the federal government or AFN or IPCOM or having these other larger organizations put out there that there is co-management in place and there's harvest management in place. It's about utilizing resources and partnerships and, and making sure that the information is out there. Okay, I think we've got three minutes, so perhaps time for one more rabbit hole. <laughs> okay, yeah. Shallow one. Uh, yeah, for Eric, um, my question is, why isn't passive acoustic monitoring used more for assessing population trends? That's a good question. I'm actually going to pass that question immediately over to Aaron. <laughs> Closes the session the same way I started it. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think there are um, some some case study examples of where we can we understand enough about calling rates um, and how calling rates relate to various aspects of population demographics or population structure that we could use passive acoustic monitoring for trend assessment. But it's really those linkages that are we're still sorting out for a lot of um, species or stocks. Um, and that's where, you know, in part, I was talking about we need to be sort of rethinking some of the ways that we do some of our statistical analyses in order to be able to integrate some of the passive acoustic data sets. Um, something like trend assessment maybe is fairly straightforward um, if you're monitoring the right space. Um, but to do, say, like a full population assessment that integrated passive acoustic data, you need to be able to account for the intricacies in the detection and and what portion of the population it applies to and and all those things as well that um, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question though but and I'll just add that I nationally I don't think it's for a lack of trying it's just really challenging um and and then of course like everything we end with so far it's funding resource limited as well all right, I think we'll we'll close the session there. Um, thanks everyone for all your great questions. And once again, thanks to the panelists for your great answers.
I'm going to jump in here as we transition to our next panel because uh, the um, Navy Memorial has been really kind to let us stay this afternoon. They have an event right after this. So when we get done at five o'clock or if, if this only goes for 45 minutes, which would be fine, uh, we should all pick up any litter we have, all our bags, all our coats. And I think as a courtesy to them, exit quickly. So I just want to, and in that in that mode, I really, I wanted to actually give my thanks right now to folks so that we can extend this discussion as long as needed. Um, so I just, I just think this has been a really great meeting and I want to thank all the speakers, many of whom came from a long, long way away, looking at Raven, looking at the folks who came from Hawaii, looking at Fernando Fair who came from La Paz or in the bottom of Baja, California. So just amazing speakers. We could not have possibly anticipated how well you would respond to the challenges we gave you with the topic of this meeting. I think every one of you just has really focused on that and given us really good stuff to think about. And then, so that is really because of the moderators and also the staff committee members and commissioners who help prepare these sessions. We've been working on it for a, a fair number of months and the, the depth that we got to really reflects the depth of our staff, scientific advisors and commissioners. So thanks to all of you. And then I hold up a thing that says applause. Yeah, anyway, no. And then I want to single out a few people on staff. I want to, first of all, I'm not sure if Daryl is in here because I didn't warn her that I was going to thank her right now. But um, Daryl Jordan has done so much on the logistics. It was Daryl who got you here if you traveled on the Marine Mammal funding, worked with, worked with everybody on the CSA and the commissioners, as well as all the speakers to get everyone here. She's worked with the venue a great deal to get everything sorted out and just is sort of gone beyond the call of duty. So if anyone sees Daryl Jordan, tell her that I worship her. And then that, that sort of a subset of the staff who arranged the venue, we've come down here a number of times. We've had a number of virtual meetings with the folks here to get the audio visual right to get the webinar right, to get these screens to come up the way they have. The people in the audience can't see that like when Frances is speaking in the front row, the people online can see her speaking. And so it's, it's a multifaceted AV thing. We can see you when you're talking to Jason too. So, um, so particularly Brady, Lori Leach, Jackie Schaff, Mike, was down and and Daryl Kathy Shrestha came down. We've all and Vicky came down to help us get this sorted out. So, really, who did I miss? Aaron, where's Aaron? Oh, she was over there. I'm so sorry, Aaron. Anyway, we all come down and do that, and you can never thank people, right? So, thanks all of you for that. Um, sorry, there isn't more of a list. It goes without saying to thank the commissioners, the Committee of Scientific Advisors, and all the staff for the whole thing. And again, to the commissioners, I said it when we started. Well, there's one of them. Yeah, I said it when we started. Thank you for taking on the leadership and giving us the, you, you all came up with the agenda. So I've said all along, if this meeting's a failure, it's because of them. Yes. They came in with this agenda, and I kind of said, how are we going to do that? That's really challenging. And it's turned out to be just fantastic. So we've done everything we can to make it work, but you guys had the, the vision to do it. So thanks to you guys. Um, and also leading us through years of COVID and all that other stuff. So, <laughs> and then finally, I wanna thank Admiral Thorpe, Therese and Chris from this facility who at the Navy Memorial, who've done amazing. I mean, they just kind of welcomed us and said, come here, do whatever you want. We will figure it out. And Chris is an AV genius. Therese is like 
the most welcoming person I've ever met in my life. And Admiral Thorpe has been supportive. He came here yesterday to talk to me about the rally that was outside and to just say, we really want you all to have your meeting continue. It's not really a worry, but I just want you to be aware of it. So Admiral Thorpe, Therese, and Chris, you may not hear what I say, but I mean it. Thank you very much. So I'll say I'm I've I've learned my real specialty, which is I can make people be on time. I never knew what I could actually do, and this has really confirmed that. So I'm going to say it again, as a courtesy to these folks who've been so great to us. As we get done with this session, please look around your area, grab stuff. They're going to have to clean this whole place for an event tonight. So grab stuff, get out, and we can at least get out of the out of the hall. 